Prologue to Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. Prologue. One. The long fall roundup was over the wagon homeward bound made camp for the last night out of the sinks of lost river most of the men worn with threescore night guards were buried under their tarps in the deep sleep of the weary sound as that of the just and much more common by the low campfire a few yet lingered old-timers iron men whose wiry and seasoned strength was toil-proof and leo ballinger for whom youth excitement and unsated novelty served in lieu of fitness the fire lighters working the wide range again from ancho to hueco from the malpais to glencoe fell silent now to mark an unstaled miracle the clustered lights of rainbow's end shone redly near and low beyond above dominant the black unbroken bulk of rainbow range shut out the east the clear-cut crest mellowed to luminous curves feathery with far-off pines the long skyline thrilled with frosty fire glowed sparkled the cricket's chirp was stilled the slow late moon rose to a hushed and waiting world on the sharp crest she paused irresolute tiptoe quivering rosily a flush above floated a web of gossamer she leaped up spurning the black rim glowed palpitant through that filmy lace and all the desert throbbed with vibrant light cool and sweet and fresh from maiden leagues of clean brown earth the desert winds made whisper in grass and fragrant shrub yucca mesquite and greasewood swayed so softly you had not known save as the long shadows courtesied and danced leo flung up his hand the air was wine to him a year had left the desert still new and strange gee he said eloquently headlight nodded you're dead right on that point son if christopher k columbus had only thought to beach his shallops on the sundown side of this here continent he might have made a name for himself just think how much different hysterically these united states this united states corrected pringle dispassionately their fathers had disagreed on the same grammatical point headlight scowled by jings that this united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states he quoted i was going to give you something new to exercise your talons on you sit here every night riding broncs and four-footin steers and never grab a horn or waste a loop not once sure things ain't amusin some variety and doubtful accuracy now would develop our guessin gifts aforesaid smith brandished the end-gate rod them speculations of yours sort of opens up of themselves if california had been settled first the salmon would now be our national bird instead of the potato think of arizona mother of presidents seat of the government at milpitas center of population about butte new jersey howlin' about nevada trust he impaled a few beef ribs and held them over the glowing embers georgia and south carolina would be infested by cow persons in decollete leather panties said jeff bransford new york and pennsylvania would be fondly turning a credulous ear to the twenty-fourth consecutive solemn promise of statehood with the senator from walla walla urging admission of both as one mighty state with maryland and virginia thrown in for luck headlight forgot his peak wouldn't the railroad sound funny though needles and eastern northern atlantic southern atlantic union western kansas and central atlantic earnest and continuous demand for a president from east of the mississippi all the prize fights pulled off at boston columbus done just right said pingle decisively you fellers ain't got no imagination at all 
if this western country'd been settled first the maps would read northeast territory uninhabitable wilderness region of storm and snow roaming savages and fierce wild beasts when the intrepid explorer hit the big white weather he'd say little old san diego's good enough for me yes sir oh well climate alone doesn't account for the charm of this country nor scenery said leo you feel it but you don't know why it is it sure agrees with your bylaws observed pringle you're a sight changed from the furtive behemoth you was you'll make a hand yet but even now your dimensions from east to west is plum fascinatin i'd sure admire to have your picture to put in my cornfield very well mr pringle i'll exchange photographs with you said leo artlessly a smothered laugh followed this remark uncertainty as to what horrible and unnamed use leo would make of pringle's pictured face appealed to these speculative minds i've studied out this charm business said jeff see if i'm not right it's because there's no habitually old men here to pattern after to steady us to make us ashamed of just stayin' boys now and then you hit an octagonal cuss like wes here that on a mere count of years and hairs might be sized up as old by the superficial observer but if i've ever met that man more addicted with vivid nonchalance as to further continuance of educational facilities than this same also ran his number has now escaped me really aged people stay where they was i think myself that what makes life so easy and congenial in these latigos and longitudes is the dearth of law and the ladies thus pringle the cynic a fourfold outcry ensued indignant repudiation of the latter heresy their protests rose above the customary subdued and quiet drawl of the out-of-doors man but has the law no defenders demanded leo we've got to have laws to make us behave sure thing likewise tis the waves that make the tide come in said jeb a good law is as handy as a good pocket-book but law as simply such independent of its merits rouses no enthusiasm in my manly bosom no more than a signboard the day after halloween if it occurs to me in a moment of emotional sanity that the environments of the special case in hand call for a compound fracture of the statutes made and provided for some totally different cases that happen to be called by the same name i fall upon it with my glittering heel-gag without no special wonder for he declaimed i am endowed by nature with certain inalienable rights among which are the high justice the middle and the low and who's to be the judge of whether it's a good law or not you me me every time some one must if i let some other man make up my mind i've got to use my judgment picking the man i follow by organizing myself into a permanent committee of one to do my own thinking i take my one chance of mistakes instead of two so you believe in doing evil that good may come do you well said jeff judicially it seems to be at least as good a proposition as doing good that evil may come of it why capricorn there isn't one thing we call wrong when other men do it that hasn't been lawful some time or other when to break a law is to do a wrong it's evil when it's doing right to break a law it's not evil got that it's not wrong to keep a just law and if it's wrong to break an unjust law i want a new dictionary with pictures of it in the back but laws is useful and exciting diversions to break up the monogamy said aforesaid and it's a dead easy way to build up a rep look at the edge i've got on you fellows you're just supposed to be honest but i've been proved honest frequent hark said pringle a weird sound reached them the night wrangler beguiling his lonely vigil with song oh the cuckoo is a pretty bird she comes in the spring what do you suppose that nighthawk thinks about the majesty of the law he said there was a ringing note in his voice smith and headlight nodded gravely their lean brown faces hardened you haven't heard of it old john taylor daddy to yonder warbler drifted here from the east wife and little girl both puny taylor takes up a homestead on the Feliz. 
he wasn't affluent none i let him have my old paint pony freckles him being knee sprung and not out to cow work and to make an unparalleled team he got ed poe's billy bowlegs knee gambler him having won a new name by a misunderstanding with the prairie dog hole taylor paid poe for him in work he was a willin old rooster taylor but futile and left-handed all over john junior he was only thirteen him and the old man moseyed around like two drunk ants fixin up a little log house with rock chimbleys a horse pen and shelter rail fencin of the little vegas to put to crops and so on done ye good to drop in and hear em plan and figure there was one happy family how sis emily bragged about their hens layin in the spring we all held a bee and made their zacchias for them baker he loaned em a plow they dragged big branches over the ground for a harrow they could milk anybody's cows they was a mind to tame and the boys took to carryin over motherless calves from miss taylor to raise taylor he done odd jobs and they got along real well with their crops they went into the second winter pert as squirrels but come spring sis wasn't doin well they had the agency doctor too high up and too damp he said so the missus and emily they went to cruces where emily could go to school that meant right smart of expense rentin a house and all so the johns they hires out john jr made his debut as wrangler for the steam pitchfork acquirin the obvious name of felix the old man he got a job muckin in organ mines kept his osses in jeff isaac's pasture and saturday nights he'd get one and slip down them eighteen miles to cruces for sunday with the folks well you know a homesteader can't be off his claim more than six months at a time i reckon if there was ever a homestead taken up in good faith twas the butter bowl they knew the land laws from a to izzard even named their hound pup bony fido but the old man waited at organ till the last bell rang so to draw down his wages payday then he bundles the folks into his little old wagon and lights out cappin at casimoro's well halfway cross that ornery freckles hoss has a fit of malignant nostalgy and projects off for a super bowl a foot in his hobbles next day taylor don't overtake him till the middle of the evening and what with going back and what with freckles being hobble sore he's two days late in reaching home for lake of agua chiquita that prosperous person had been keeping cases he entered contest on the butter bowl a legend abandonment now if it was me but then if twas me i could stay away six years and two months without no remonstrances from lake or his likes i'm somewhat abandoned myself but poor old taylor he's been drug up where they hold biped life unaccountable high he sets him down resignedly beneath the sky as the poet says meek and legal we all don't abnormally like to precipitate in another man's business but we makes it up to sort of saunter in on lake spontaneous and events our disfavor with a rope but taylor says no he allows the land office won't hold him morally responsible for the sinful idiocy of a homesick spotted hoss that's otherwise reliable he's got one more guess comin there ain't no sympathies to machinery your intentions may be strictly honourable but if you get your hand caught in the cogs off it goes regardless of how handy it is for flankin calves holdin nails and such things absent over six months entry cancelled contestant is allowed thirty days prior rights to file next that's the way that decision'll read it ain't come yet but it's due soon this here felix looks at it just like the old man only different though he ain't makin no statements for publication he comes here young and having acquired the fixed habit of riskin his neck regular for one dollar per each and every diem showin in the reluctant steer or a fool hawse pirouettin across the pinnacles with a nose-bag on or maybe just for fun why well, naturally don't see why life is so sweet or peace so dear as to put up with any damn foolishness as pat henry used to say when the boys called on him for a few remarks he's a some serious-minded boy that night-hawk and if signs is any indication he's fixin to take an appeal under the winchester act 
i ain't no seventh son of a son of a gun but my prognostications are that he presently removes lake to another and we trust better world good thing too grunted headlight this lake person is surely a muddy pool jet ye fool head said pringle amiably you may be on the jury i'm going to seek my virtuous couch glad we don't have to bed no cattle viva voce this night ain't he the latin scholar said headlight admiringly they blow about that wire julius caesar sent the associated press but old man pringle done him up for levity and precision when he wrote us the account of his visit to the denver carnival ever hear about a sagittarius no said leo what did he say hic hoc hike two escondido halfway of the desert is designed on simple lines the railroad hauls water in tank cars from dog canyon there is one depot one section house and one combination post office hotel store saloon state station kept by ma sanders and pappy sanders in about the order mentioned also one glorious green cottonwood one pampered rosebush jointly the pride and delight of escondido ownerless but cherished by loving care and a toted tribute of wastewater hither came jeff and leo white with the dust of twenty starlit leagues for accumulated mail of rainbow south horse feeding breakfast gossip with jolly motherly ma sanders reading and answering of mail then their beauty nap so missing the day's event the passing of the flyer when they woke escondido basked drowsily in the low westering sun the far sunset ranges had put off their workaday homespun brown and gray for chameleon hues of purple and amethyst their deep cool shadows edged with trembling rose reached out across the desert the velvet air stirred faintly to the promise of the night the agent was putting up his switch lights from the kitchen came a cheerful clatter of tinware now we buy some dry goods and wet said leo they went into the store that decision's come shrilled pappy in tremulous excitement it's too durn bad registered letters from land office for taylor and lake besides another for lake not registered that one from the land office too said jeff didn't i just tell you say it's a shame why don't some of you fellers gosh if i was only young it's a travesty on justice exclaimed leo indignantly there's really no doubt but that they decided for lake i suppose not a bit he's got the law with him then him and the register is old cronies guess this other letter is from him unofficial likely jeff seated himself on a box how long has this lake got to do his filing in pappy thirty days from the time he signs the receipts for this letter durn him some one ought to kidnap him said leo why that's illegal jeff nursed his knee turned his head to one side and chanted thoughtfully said the little leopus i'm going to be a horse and on my middle finger-nails to run my earthly course he broke off and smiled at leo indulgently leo glanced at him sharply this was jeff's war song aforetime but it was to pappy that jeff spoke dad you're a better than any surgeon wish you'd go out and look at leo's horse his ankle's all swelled up i'll be mixing me up a toddy if ma's got any hot water i'm feeling kinder squeamish hot toddy this weather some folks has queer taste grumbled pappy excuse me me and leo go look at the charley horse that bottle under the shelf is the best he bustled out but jeff caught ballinger by the sleeve will you hold my garments while i stone stephen he hissed i will said leo meeting jeff's eye hit him once for me move the lever to the right you old retrograde and get pappy to gyratin on his axis some fifteen or twenty minutes you listenin reverently meanwhile i'll make the necessary incantations git don't look so blamed intelligent or pappy'll be suspicious bransford hastened to the kitchen ma sanders a bronc fell on me yesterday and my poor body is one big stone bruise can i borrow some boiling water to mix a small prescription or maybe seven one when you first feel like it and repeat at intervals the doctor says 
don't you get full in my house jeff bramford or i'll feed you to the hogs you take three doses and that'll be a plenty for you jeff put the steaming kettle on the rusty store stove used as a waste paper basket through the long summer touching off the papers with a match he smashed an empty box and put it in then he went into the post office corner and laid impious hands on the united states mail first he steamed open lake's unregistered letter from the land office it was merely a few typewritten lines having no reference to the butter bowl enclosing the plant of t p fourteen e of first guide meridian east range south of third standard parallel south as per request he paused to consider his roving eye lit on the wall where the annual report of the governor of new mexico hung from a nail the very thing he said pasted in the report was a folded map of the territory this he cut out refolded it until it slipped in the violated envelope dabbed the flap neatly with pappy's mucilage and returned the letter to its proper pigeonhole he replenished the fire with another box subjected lake's registered letter to the steaming process and opened it with delicate caution it was the decision it was in lake's favor and it went into the fire substituting for it the plat of t p fourteen and the accompanying letter he resealed it with workmanlike neatness and then restored it with a final inspection the editor sits on the madhouse floor and plays with the straws of his hair he murmured beaming with complacent pride and reaching for the bottle pappy and leo found him with his hands to the blaze shivering i feel like i was going to have a chill he complained but with a few remedial measures he recuperated sufficiently to set off for rainbow after supper charlie's ankle seems better said leo artlessly don't you lay no stress on charlie's ankle said jeff in a burst of confidence where ignorance is bliss tis folly to be otherwise just let charlie's ankle slip your memory the following day bransford drew rein at west pringle's shack and summoned him forth mr john wesley also ran pringle he said impressively i have taken a horse ride over here to put you through your cataclysm will you truthfully answer the rebuses i shall now propound to the best of your ability and govern yourself accordingly till the surface of hades congeals to glistening bergs and that with no unseemly curiosity is it serious asked pringle anxiously this is straight talk pringle took a long look and held up his hand i will he said soberly john wesley do you or do you not believe stephen w lake of agua chiquiti to be a low-down coniferous skunk by birth inclination and training i do john wesley do you or do you not possess the full confidence and affection of felix the night hawk otherwise known and designated as john taylor jr of butterbowl esq i do do you john wesley pringle esteem me jeff bransford irrespective of color sex or previous condition of turpitude to be such a one as may be safely tied to when all the hitching posts done pulled up and will you now promise to love honor and obey me till the cows come home or till further orders i do i will and may god have mercy on my soul here are your powders then do you go and locate the above-mentioned and described felix and impart to him under the strict seal of secrecy these tidings to wit namely that you have a presentiment almost amounting to conviction that the butterbowl contest is decided in lake's favor but that your further presentiment is that said lake will not use his prior right if taylor should get such a decision from the land office don't let him or felix say a word to no one if mr b bodie should ask tell him twas a map or land laws or something moreover said felix he is not to stab cut pierce or otherwise mutilate said lake 
nor to wickedly maliciously feloniously and unlawfully fire at or upon the person of said lake with any rifle pistol musket or gun the same being then and there loaded with powder and with balls shot bullets or slugs of lead or other metal you see to that personal i'd go to him myself but he don't know me well enough to have confidence in my divinations you promulgate these prophecies as your sole personal device and construction sabe then thirty days after lake signs a receipt for his decision and you will take steps to inform yourself of that you sidle casually down to roswell with old man taylor and see that he puts preemption papers on the butter bowl c'est là three the first knowledge lake had of the state of affairs was when the steam pitchfork punchers informally extended to him the right hand of fellowship hitherto withheld under the impression that he had generously abstained from pushing home his vantage when in the mid-flood of his unaccountable popularity the situation dawned upon him he wisely held his peace he was a victim of the accomplished fact taylor had already filed his preemption so lake reaped volunteer harvest of good will bearing his honors in graceful silence on lake's next trip to escondido pappy sanders laid aside his marked official hauteur lake stayed several days praised the rosebush and ma sanders cookery and indulged in much leisurely converse with pappy thereafter he had a private conference with stratton the register of the roswell land office his suspicion fell quite naturally on felix and on jeff as accessory during the fact so it was that when jeff and leo took in roswell fair where jeff won a near prize at the roping match hobart the united states marshal came to their room after introducing himself he said mr stratton would like to see you mr bransford why that's all right said jeff genially uh, some of my very great grand folks was dakotas and i've got my name and who's sue but i'm not proud trot him around exact who is stratton anyhow he's the register of the land office and he wants to see you there on a very particular business i'd go if i was you said the marshal significantly oh that way said jeff is this an arrest or do you just give me this invite semi officiously you accuse yourself sir were you expect an arrest that sounds like a bad conscience don't you worry about my conscience if i've ever done anything i'm sorry for i'm glad of it now this stratton party is he some aged and venerable cause if he is i waive ceremony and seek him in his lair at the witching hour of two this tarday and if not not he's old enough even if there were no other reasons never mind any other reasons it shall never be said that i fail to reverence gray hairs i'll be there i guess i'll just wait and see that you go said the marshal have you got any papers for me asked jeff politely no this is my room said jeff this is my fist this is me this is my door open it leo mr hobart you will now make rapid forward motions with your feet alternately like a man removing his company from where it is not desired or i'll go through you like a domesticated cyclone see you at two sharp hobart obeyed he was a good judge of men jeff closed the door we went upon the battlefield he said plaintively before us and behind us and every which away we looked we seen a rosarinus we went into another field behind us and before us and every which way we looked we seen a rhinosaurus mr lake has been evidently browsing and perusing around and poor old pappy not being posted has likely been narrating about charlie's ankle and how i got a chill warm em it looks that way confessed leo did you have a chill jeff jeff's eyes crinkled not so nigh as i am now but shucks i've been in worse emergencies and i always emerged thanks be i can always do my best when i have to oh what a tangled web we weave when we don't keep in practice if i'd just come out straight forward and declared myself to pappy he'd a tightened up his drawstrings and forgot all about my chill 
but no well as i know from long experience that good old human nature only too willin to do the right thing and the fair thing if somebody'd only tip it off to em i must play a lone hand and not even call for my partner's best well i'm goin to ramify round and scrutinize this here stratton's numbers equipments and disposition meet me in the office at the fatal hour the marshal wore a mocking smile stratton large florid well-fed and eminently respectable turned in his revolving chair with a severe and majestic motion adjusted his glasses in a prolonged and offensive examination and frowned portentously fine large day isn't it observed jeff affably beautiful little city you have here he sank into a chair smile and attitude were of pleased and sprightly anticipation a faint flush showed beneath stratton's neatly trimmed mutton chops such jaunty bearing was exasperating to offended virtue ah uh, who is this other person mr hobart oh pardon my rudeness jeff sprang up and bowed brisk apology mr stratton allow me to present mr ballinger a worthy representative of the yellow press mr stratton mr ballinger i have a communication to make to you said the displeased mr stratton in icy tones which in your own interest should be extremely private the marshal whispered to him stratton gave leo a fiercely intimidating glare communicate away said jeff airily excommunicate if you want to mr ballinger as a citizen is part owner of this office if you want to bar him you'll have to change the venue to your private residence and then i won't come very well sir mr stratton rose inflated his chest and threw back his head his voice took on a steady roll mr bransford you stand under grave displeasure of the law you are grievously suspected of being cognizant of if not actually accessory to the robbery of the united states mail by john taylor jr at escondido on the eighteenth day of last october you may not be aware of it but you have an excellent chance of serving a term in the penitentiary jeff pressed his hands between his knees and leaned forward i'm sure i'd never be satisfied there he said with conviction his white teeth flashed in an ingratiatory smile but why suspect young john why not old john he paused looking at the register attentively hm you're from indiana i believe mr stratton he said the elder taylor on the day in question is fully accounted for said hobart young taylor claims to have passed the night at willow springs alone but no one saw him from breakfast time the seventeenth till noon on the nineteenth he rarely ever has any one with him when he's alone that may account for them not seeing him at willow suggested jeff he did not look at hobart but regarded stratton with an air of deep meditation the register paced the floor slowly ponderously with an impressive pause at each turn tapping his left hand with his eyeglass to score his points he had ample time to go to escondido and return the envelope in which mr lake's copy of this office's decision in the lake taylor contest was enclosed has been examined it bears unmistakable signs of having been tampered with turning to mark the effect of these tactics he became aware of his victim's contemplative gaze it disconcerted him he resumed his pacing jeff followed him with a steady eye in the same mail i sent mr lake another letter the envelope was unfortunately destroyed mr lake suspecting nothing a map had been substituted for its contents and they in turn were substituted for the decision in the registered letter with the evident intention of depriving mr lake of his prior right to file by george it sounds probable jeff laughed derisively so that's it and here we all thought lake let it go out of giddy generosity my stars but won't he get the horse smile when the boys find out stratton controlled himself with an effort we have decided not to push the case against you if you will tell what you know he began jeff lifted his brows we and who's we you two i should have thought this was a post office lay we are investigating the affair exclaimed hobart i see as private individuals 
yes yes does uh, lake pay you by the day or by the job stratton blazing with anger smote his palm heavily with his fist young man young man your insolence is unbearable we are trying to spare you as you had no direct interest in the matter and doubtless concealed your guilty knowledge through a mistaken and distorted sense of honour but you tempt us you tempt us you don't seem to realise the precarious situation in which you stand what i don't see said jeff in puzzled tones is why you bother to spare me at all if you can prove this why don't you cinch me and felix both why do you want me to tell you what you already know but if you can't prove it who the hell cares what you suspect we will arrest you said stratton thickly just as soon as we can make out the papers turn your wolf loose you four fleshers you may make me trouble but you can't prove anything speaking of trouble how about you mr stratton as a spring leaps released from highest tension face and body and voice flashed from passive indolence to sudden startling attack his arm lashed swiftly out as if to deliver the swordsman's stabbing thrust the poised body followed up to push the stroke home you think your secret safe don't you it's been some time ago words only yet it might have been a very sword's point past stratton's guard for the register flinched staggered his arrogant face grew mottled his arm went up he fell back a step silent quivering leaning heavily on a chair the marshal gave him a questioning glance jeff kept on you're prominent in politics business society the church you've a family to think of it's up to you mr stratton is it worth while had we better drop it with a dull sickening thud stratton collapsed into the chair a shapeless bundle turning a shriveled feeble face to the marshal in voiceless imploring unhesitating hobart put a hand on his shoulder that's all right old man we won't give you away brace up he nodded jeff to the door you win he said leo followed on tiptoe why the poor old duck said jeff remorsefully in the passage wish i hadn't come down on him so hard i overdid it that time still if i hadn't at the hondo bridge jeff looked back and waved a hand good-bye old town now we go gallopy trot gallopy gallopy trot he sang and the ringing hoofs kept time and tune florence my hedible geneva jane she came home in the wind and the rain she came home in the rain and the snow ain't a goin to leave my home any mo jeff said the mystified ballinger spurring up beside him what has the grey-haired register done has murder stained his hands with gore jeff raised his bridle hand gee leo i don't know i just taken a chance End of prologue. Chapter One of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One: The Pitcher That Went to the Well. When I bend my head low and listen at the ground, I can hear vague voices that I used to know, stirring in dim places, faint and restless sound. I remember how it was when the grass began to grow. Song of the Wandering Dust anna hampstead branch the pines thinned as she neared rainbow rim the turfy glades grew wider she had glimpses of open country beyond until at last crossing a little spit of high ground she came to the fairest spot in all her voyage of exploration and discovery she sank down on a fallen log with a little sigh of delight the steep bank of a little canyon broke away at her feet a canyon which here marked the frontier of the pines its farther side overgrown with mahogany bush and chaparral a canyon that fell in long sinuous curves from the silent mystery of forest on rainbow crest behind her to widen just below into a rolling land parked with green black powder puffs of juniper and cedar and so passed on to mystery again twisting away through the folds of the low and bare gray hills to the westward ere the last stupendous plunge over the rim to the low desert a mile toward the level of the waiting sea 
facing the explorer across the little canyon a clear spring bubbled from the hillside and fell with pleasant murmur and tinkle to a pool below fringed with lush emerald a spring massed about with wild grapevine shining reeds of arrowweed a tangle of grateful greenery jostling eagerly for the life-giving water draped in clinging vines slim acacias struggled up through the jungle the exquisite fragrance of their purple bells gave a final charm to the fairy chasm but the larger vision the nearer elfin beauty dwindled was lost forgotten afar through a narrow cleft in the grey westward hills the explorer's eye leaped out over a bottomless gulf to a glimpse of shining leagues midway of the desert greatness an ever widening triangle that rose against the peaceful west to long foothill reaches to a misty mountain parapet far beckoning whispering of secrets things dreamed of unseen beyond the framed and slender arc of vision a land of enchantment and mystery decked with strong barbaric colors blue and red and yellow brown and green and gray whose changing ebb and flow by some potent sorcery of atmosphere distance and angle altered daily hourly deepening fading combining into new and fantastic lines and shapes to melt again as swiftly to others yet more bewildering the explorer it may be mentioned in passing that any other would have found that fairest prospect even more wonderful than did the explorer miss eleanor hoffman we will attempt no clear description of miss eleanor hoffman dusky beautiful she was crisp fresh and sparkling tall vigorous active strong yet she was more than merely beautiful warm and frank and young brave and kind and true perhaps even more than soft curves lips glory of hair or bewildering eyes or altogether her chiefest charm was her manner her frank friendliness earth was sweet to her sweeter for her this by way of aside and all to no manner of good you have no picture of her in your mind remember only that she was young the stars to drink from and the sky to dance on young and happy and therefore beautiful that the sun was shining in a cloudless sky the south wind sweet and fresh buds in the willow the peace was rent and shivered by strange sounds as of a giant falling downstairs there was a crash of breaking boughs beyond the canyon a glint of colour a swift black body hurling madly through the shrubbery the girl shrank back there was no time for thought hardly for alarm on the farther verge the bushes parted an apparition hurled arching through the sunshine down the sheer hill a glorious and acrobatic horse his black head low between his flashing feet red nostrils wide with rage and fear foam flecks white on the black shoulders a tossing mane a rider straight and tall superb to all seeming an integral part of the horse pitch he never so wildly the girl held her breath through the splintered seconds she thrilled at the shock and storm of them straining muscles and white hoofs lurching stumbling sliding lunging careening in perilous arcs she saw stones that rolled with them or bounded after a sombrero whirled above the dust and tumult like a dilatory parachute a six-shooter jolted up into the air through the dust clouds there were glimpses of a watchful face hair blown back above it a broken rein snapped beside it saddle strings streamed out behind a supple body that swung from curve to easy curve against shock and plunge that swayed and poised and clung and held its desperate dominion still the saddle slipped forward with a motion incredibly swift as a hat is whipped off in a gust of wind it whisked over withers and neck and was under the furious feet swifter the rider cat quick he swerved lit on his feet leaped aside alas o oh, rider beyond compare undefeated champion pride of rainbow 
alas that such things should be recorded he leaped aside to shun the black frantic death at his shoulder his feet were in the treacherous vines he toppled grasped vainly at an acacia catapulted out and down head first so lit crumpled and fell with a prodigious splash into the waters of the pool ay to me alama the blankets lay strewn along the hill but observe that the long lead rope of the hackamore a hackamore or properly hakima is for your better understanding merely a rope halter was coiled at the saddle horn held there by a stout horn string as the black reached the level the saddle was at his heels to kick was obvious to go away not less so but this new terror clung to the maddened creature in his frenzied flight between his legs in the air at his heels his hip his neck a low tree leaned from the hillside the aerial saddle caught in the forks of it the bronco's head was jerked round he was pulled to his haunches overthrown but the tough horn string broke the freed coil snapped out at him he scrambled up and bunched his glorious muscles in a vain and furious effort to outrun the rope that dragged at his heels and so passed from sight beyond the next curve waist deep in the pool sat the hatless horseman or perhaps horseless horsemen were the juster term steeped in a profound calm that last phrase has a familiar sound mark twain's doubtless but all things considered steeped is decidedly the word one gloved hand was in the water the other in the muddy margin of the pool he watched the final evolution of his late mount with meditative interest the saddle was freed at last but its ex-occupant still sat there lost in thought blood trickled unnoted down his forehead the last stone followed him into the pool the echoes died on the hills the spring resumed its pleasant murmur but the tinkle of its fall was broken by the mimic waves of the pool save for this troubled sloshing against the banks the slow settling dust and the contemplative bust of the one-time centaur no trace was left to mark the late disastrous invasion the invader's dreamy and speculative gaze followed the dust of the trailing rope he opened his lips twice or thrice and spoke after several futile attempts in a voice mild but clearly earnest oh you little hippus the spellbound girl rose her hand was at her throat her eyes were big and round and her astonished lips were drawn to a round red o sharp ears heard the rustle of her skirts her soft gasp of amazement the merman turned his head briskly his eyes met hers one gloved hand brushed his brow a broad streak of mud appeared there over which the blood meandered uncertainly he looked up at the maid in silence in silence the maid looked down at him he nodded with a pleasant smile good morning he said casually at this cheerful greeting the astounded maid was near to tumbling after like jill of the song uh good morning she gasped silence the merman reclined gently against the bank with a comfortable air of satisfaction the color came flooding back to her startled face oh are you hurt she cried a puzzled frown struggled through the mud hurt he echoed who me why no leastwise i guess not he wiggled his fingers raised his arms wagged his head doubtfully and slowly first sidewise and then up and down shook himself guardedly and finally raised tentative boot tips to the surface after this painstaking inspection he settled contentedly back again oh no i'm all right he reported only i lost a big black fine young nice horse somehow you ain't seen nothing of him have you then why don't you get out she demanded i believe you're hurt get out why yes ma'am certainly why not but the girl was already beginning to clamber down grasping the shrubbery to aid in the descent now the bank was steep and sheer so the merman rose tactfully clutching the grapevines behind him as a plausible excuse for turning his back it followed as a corollary of this generous act 
that he must needs be lame which he accordingly became as this mishap became acute his quick eyes roved down the canyon where he saw what gave him pause and he groaned sincerely under his breath for the black horse had taken to the parked uplands the dragging rope had tangled in a snaggy tree root and he was tracing weary circles in bootless effort to be free tactful still the dripping merman hobbled to the nearest shade wherefrom the luckless black horse should be invisible eclipsed by the intervening ridge and there sank down in a state of exhaustion his back to a friendly tree trunk End of chapter one Chapter Two of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, First Aid. O oh, woman, in our hours of ease, uncertain, coy, and hard to please, but seen too oft, familiar with thy face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace a moment later the girl was beside him pity in her eyes let me see that cut on your head she said she dropped on her knee and parted the hair with a gentle touch why you're real breathed the injured near centaur beaming with wonder and gratification she sat down limply and gave way to wild laughter so are you she retorted why that is exactly what i was thinking i thought maybe i was asleep and having an extraordinary dream that wound on your head is not serious if that's all she brushed back a wisp of hair that blew across her eyes i hurt this head just the other day observed the bedraggled victim as one who has an assortment of heads from which to choose he pulled off his soaked gloves and regarded them ruefully them that go down to deep waters that was a regular triumph of matter over mind wasn't it it's a wonder you're alive my how frightened i was aren't you hurt truly ribs or anything the patient's elbows made a convulsive movement to guard the threatened ribs oh no ma'am I, I ain't hurt a bit indeed i ain't he said truthfully but his eyes had the languid droop of one who says the thing that is not don't you worry none about me not one bit sorry i frightened you that black horse now he stopped to consider fully the case of the black horse well you see ma'am that black horse he ain't exactly right plumb gentle his eyelids drooped again the girl considered she believed him both that he was not badly hurt and that the black horse was not exactly gentle and her suspicions were aroused his slow drawl was getting slower his cowboy ease broader a mode of speech quite inconsistent with that first sprightly remark about the little eopis what manner of cowboy was this from whose tongue a learned scientific term tripped spontaneously in so stressful a moment who quoted scraps of the litany unaware also her own eyes were none of the slowest she had noted that the limping did not begin until he was clear of the pool still that might happen if one were excited but this one had been singularly calm more than usual calm she mentally noted of course if he really were badly hurt which she didn't believe one bit a little bruised and jarred maybe the only thing for her to do would be to go back to camp and get help that meant the renewal of lake's hateful attentions and for the other girls the sharing of her find she stole another look at her find and thrilled with all the pride of the discoverer no doubt he was shaken and bruised after all he must be suffering what a splendid writer he was what made you so absurd why didn't you get out of the water then if you are not hurt she snapped suddenly the drooped lids raised brown eyes looked steadily into brown eyes i didn't want to wake up he said the candour of this explanation threw her for the moment into a vivid and becoming confusion the dusky roses leaped to her cheeks the long dark lashes quivered and fell then she rose to the occasion and how about the little eopus she demanded that doesn't seem to go well with some of your other talk oh 
he regarded her with pained but unflinching innocence the latin you mean why ma'am that's most all the latin i know that and some more big words in that song i learned that song off of frank john just like a poll parrot sing it and the opus ain't latin it's greek why ma'am i can't just now i'm so muddy but i'll tell it to you maybe i'll sing it to you some other time a sidelong glance accompanied this little suggestion the girl's face was blank and non-committal so he resumed it goes like this said the little leopas i'm going to be a horse and on my middle finger nails to run my earthly course no that wasn't the first it begins there was once a little animal no bigger than a fox and on five toes he scampered of course you know ma'am frank john he told me about it that horses were little like that way back and this one he said his silly head that he was going to be a really truly horse like the song says and folks told him he couldn't couldn't possibly be done no how and sure enough he did it's a foolish song really i only sing parts of it when i feel like that like it couldn't be done and i was going to do it you know the boys call it my song look here ma'am he fished in his vest pocket and produced tobacco and papers and matches last of all a tiny turquoise horse an inch long i had a jeweler man put five toes on his feet once to make him be a little leopus going to make a watch charm of him some time he's a lucky little leopus i think peso gave him to me when well, never mind when peso's a mescalero indian you know chief of police at the agency he gingerly dropped the little horse into her eager palm it was a singularly grotesque and angular little beast high-stepping high-headed with a level stare at once complacent and haughty despite the first unprepossessing rigidity of outline there was somehow a sprightly air something endearing in the stiff purposed stride the alert inquiring ears the stern and watchful eye each tiny hoof was faintly graven to semblance of five tinier toes there the work showed fresh the cunning little monster prison grime was on him she groomed and polished at his dingy sides until the wonderful color shone out triumphant what is it that makes him such a dear oh i know it's something well childlike you know think of the grown-up child that toiled with pride and joy at the making of him dear me how many lifetimes since and fondly put him by as a complete horse she held him up in the sun the ingrate met her caress with the same obdurate and indomitable glare she laughed her rapturous delight there how much better you look oh you darling aren't you absurd straight-backed stiff-legged thick-necked square-headed and that ridiculously baleful eye it's too high up and too far forward you know and your ears are too big and you have such a malignant look oh, never mind now that you're all nice and clean i'm going to reward you her lips just brushed him the lucky little eopus the owner of the lucky little horse was not able to repress one swift dismal glance at his own vast dishevelment nor as his shrinking hands entirely of their own volition crept stealthily to hiding the slightest upward rolling of a hopeful eye toward the leaping waters of the spring but if one might judge from her sedate and matter-of-fact tones that eloquent glance was wasted on the girl you ought to take better care of him you know she said as she restored the little monster to his owner then she laughed hasn't he a fierce and warlike appearance though sure that's resolution look at those legs said the owner fondly he spurns the ground he's going somewheres he's going to be a horse and them ears one cocked forward and the other back strictly on a cuidado he'll make it he'll certainly do to take along yes ma'am i'll take right good care of him he regarded the homely beast with awe he swathed him in cigarette papers with tenderest care i'll leave him at home after this he might get hurt i might some time want to give him to somebody the girl sprang up now i must get some water and wash that head she announced briskly 
oh no i can't let you do that i can walk i ain't hurt a bit i keep telling you in proof of which he walked to the pool with a palpably clever assumption of steadiness the girl fluttered solicitous at his elbow then she ran ahead climbed up to the spring and extended a firm cool hand which he took shamelessly and so came to the fairy waterfall here he made himself presentable as to face and hands it is just possible there was a certain expectancy in his eye as he neared the close of these labors but if there were it passed unnoted the girl bathed the injured head with her handkerchief and brushed back his hair with a dainty caressing motion that thrilled him until the color rose beneath the tan there was a glint of gray in the waving black hair she noted she stepped back to regard her handiwork now you look better she said approvingly then slightly flurried not without a memory of a previous and not dissimilar remark of hers she was off up the hill whence despite his shocked protest she brought back the lost gun and hat her eyes were sparkling when she returned her face glowing ignoring his reproachful gaze she wrung out her handkerchief led the patient firmly down the hill into his saddle made him trim off a saddle string and bound the handkerchief to the wound she fitted the sombrero gently there don't this head feel better now she queried gaily with fine disregard for grammar and now what won't you come back to camp with me mr lake will be glad to put you up or to let you have a horse do you live far away i do hope you are not one of those rosebud men mr Le she bit her speech off midward no men there except this mr lake asked the cowboy idly oh yes there's mr herbert he's gone riding with letty and mr white but it was mr lake who got up the camping party mother and aunt lot and a crowd of us girls la luce girls you know mother and i are visiting mr lake's sister he's going to give us a masquerade ball when we get back next week the cowboy looked down his nose for consultation and his nose gave a meditative little tweak what lake is it there's some several lakes around here is it lake of agua chiquita wears his hair decollete talks like he had a washboard in his throat tailor-made face walks like a duck on stilts general sort of powder pigeon effect at this envenomed description miss eleanor hoffman promptly choked i don't know anything about your agua chiquita never heard of the place before he is a banker in arcadia he keeps a general store there you must know him surely so far her voice was rather stern and purposefully resentful as became mr lake's guest but there were complications rankling memories of mr lake of unwelcome attentions persistently forced upon her she spoiled the rebuke by adding tartly but i think he is the man you mean and felt her wrongs avenged the cowboy's face cleared well i don't use arcadia much you see i mostly range down rainbow river arcadia folks why they're mostly newcomers health seekers and people just living on their incomes not working folks much except the railroaders and lumbermen now about getting home you see ma'am some of the boys are riding down that way he jerked his thumb to indicate the last flight of the imperfectly gentle horse and they're right apt to see my runaway eopus and sure to see the rope drag so they'll likely amble along the back track to see how much who's hurt so i guess i'd better stay here they may be along most any time thank you kindly just the same of course if they don't come at all is your camp far not not very said eleanor the mere fact was that miss eleanor had set out ostensibly for a sketching expedition with another girl had turned aside to explore and exploring had fetched a circuit that had left her much closer to her starting place than to her goal he misinterpreted the slight hesitation well ma'am i thank you again but i mustn't be keeping you longer i really ought to see you safe back to your camp but you'll understand under the circumstances you'll excuse me 
he did not want to implicate mr lake so he took a limping step forward to justify his rudeness and you hardly able to walk ridiculous what i ought to do is to go back to camp and get someone get mr white to help you thus at once accepting his unspoken explanation and offering her own apology in turn she threw aside the air of guarded hostility that had marked the last minutes and threw herself anew into this joyous adventure when or if your friends find you won't it hurt you to ride she asked and smiled deliberate encouragement i can be as modest as anybody when there's anything to be modest about but in this case i guess i'll now declare that i can ride anything that a saddle will stay on i reckon he added reflectively the boys will have right smart to say about me being throwed but you weren't thrown you rode magnificently her eyes flashed admiration yes um uh, that's what i hoped you'd say said the admired one complacently go on ma'am say it again it was splendid the saddle turned that's all he slowly surveyed the scene of his late exploit yes that was some riding for a while he admitted but you see that saddle now scarred up there that way why they'll think the eopist wasted me and then dragged the saddle off under a tree leastways they'll say they think so frequent best not to let on and to make no excuses it'll be easier that way we're great on guying here that's most all the fun we have we sure got this joshing game down fine just wondering what all the boys'll say that was why i didn't get out of the water at first before before i thought i was asleep you know so you'll actually tell a lie to keep from being thought a liar i'm disappointed in you why ma'am i won't say anything they'll do the talkin it'll be deceitful just the same she began and checked herself suddenly a small twinge struck her at the thought of poor maud really sketching on thumb butte and now disconsolately wondering what had become of lunch and fellow artists but she quelled this pang with a sage thought of the greatest good to the greatest number and clapped her hands in delight oh what a silly i am to be sure i've got a lunch basket up there but i forgot all about it in the excitement i'm sure there's plenty for two shall i bring it down to you or can you climb up if i help you there's water in the canteen and it's beautiful up there i can make it i guess said the invited guest the consummate and unblushing hypocrite make it he did with her strong hand to aid and the glen rang to the laughter of them while behind them all unnoted johnny Dinas reined up on the hillside took one sweeping glance at that joyous progress the scarred hillside the saddle and the dejected eopus in the background grinned comprehension and discreetly withdrew End of chapter two Chapter Three of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Maxwell Braze. Oh, the song, the song in the blood. Magic walks the forest, there's bewitchment on the air. Spring is on the flood. The Gypsy Heart. Well, sir, this here feller, he lit a cigarette and throwed away the match, and it fell in a powder keg, and do you know, more'n half that powder burned up before they could put it out. Yes, sir. Wildcat Thompson. Eleanor opened her basket and spread its tempting wares with pretty hostly care. Or is there such a word as hostessly? There already mr blank i declare this is too absurd we don't even know each other's names her conscious eye fell upon the ampleness of the feast amazing since it purported to have been put up for one alone and her face lit up with mischievous delight she curtsied if you please i'm the ultimate consumer he rose bowing gravely i am the personal devil glad to meet you oh i've heard of you remarked the ultimate consumer sweetly she sat down and extended her hand across the spotless linen mr lake says the personal devil flushed 
it was not because of the proffered hand which he took unhesitatingly and held rather firmly the blush was unmistakably caused by anger there is no connection whatever he stated grimly enough between the truth and mr lake's organs of speech oh cried the ultimate consumer triumphantly so you're mr b bransford jeff bransford corrected the personal devil crustily he wilfully relapsed to his former slipshod speech bb he's gone to the pecos work m and ballinger mr john wesley also ran pringle's gone to old mexico to bring back another bunch of black long-horn chihuahuas you now behold before you the last remaining rose of rosebud but why bb why does mr lake hate all of you so mr bransford because we are infamous scoundrels why bb i can't eat with one hand mr bransford she said demurely he looked at the prisoned hand with a start and released it grudgingly help yourself said his hostess cheerfully there's sandwiches and roast beef and olives for a mild beginning why b b he said doggedly help yourself to the salad and then uh, please pass it over this way uh, thank you why b b oh very well then because of the little opus you know and other things you said i see said the aggrieved bransford because i'm not from ohio like bb i'm not supposed oh if you're going to be fussy i'm from california myself mr bransford out in the country at that don't let's quarrel please we were having such a lovely time and i'll tell you a secret it's ungrateful of me and i ought not to but i don't care i don't like mr lake much since we came on this trip and i don't believe she paused pinkly conscious of the unconventional statement involved in this sudden unbelief what lake says about us a much mollified bransford finished the sentence for her she nodded then to change the subject you do speak cowboy talk one minute and all booky polite and proper the next you know why bad associations said bransford ambiguously also for tis my nature too as little dogs they do delight to bark and bite that beef sure tastes like more and now you may smoke while i pack up announced the girl when dessert was over at long last and please there's something i want to ask you about will you tell me truly hm you sing yes a little if you will sing for me afterward certainly with pleasure all right then what's the story about eleanor gave him her eyes did you rob the post office at escondido really now it might well be embarrassing to be asked if you had committed a felony but there was that behind the words of this naive inquiry in look in tone and in mental attitude an unflinching and implicit faith that since he had seen fit to do this thing it must needs have been the right and wise thing to do which stirred the felon's pulses to a pleasant flutter and caused a certain tough and powerful muscle to thump foolishly at his ribs the delicious intimacy the baseless faith was sweet to him sure i did he answered lightly lake is one talkative little man isn't he by fie but shucks what can you expect the beast will do after his kind and you'll tell me about it after i smoke got to study up some plausible excuses you know she studied him as she packed it was a good face lined strong expressive vivid gay resolute confident alert reckless perhaps there were lines of it disused fallen to abeyance what was well with the man had prospered what was ill with him had faded and dimmed he was not a young man thirty-seven thirty-eight she was twenty-four but there was an unquenchable boyishness about him despite the few frosty hairs at his temple he bore his hard years jauntily youth danced in his eyes the explorer nodded to herself well pleased he was interesting different the tale suffered from bransford's telling as any tale will suffer when marred by the inevitable barbarous modesty of its hero it was a long story cosily confidential and there were interruptions the sun was low ere it was done 
now the song said jeff and then he did not complete the sentence his face clouded what shall i sing well, how can i tell what you will what can i know about good songs or anything else responded bransford in sudden moodiness and dejection for after the song the end of everything he flinched at the premonition of irrevocable loss the girl made no answer this is what she sang no you shall not be told of her voice perhaps there is a voice that you remember that echoes to you through the dusty years how would you like to describe that oh sandy has money and sandy has land and sandy has house and say fine and sick hand but i'd rather have jamie with knock in his hand than sandy with all of his housin and land my father looks sulky my mither looks sore they gloom upon jamie because he is poor i love them baith dearly as a daughter should but i love them not half so sweet dear jamie as you i sit at my cribby i spin up my wheel i think of the laddie that loves me so weel oh he had but a sax pants he break it in twa and he gave me the half dat er he gave de wa he said lo me lang lassie though i gang away he said lo me lang lassie though i gang away bland summer is comin cold winter's away and i'll wed with jamie in spite of the may jeff's back was to a tree his hat over his eyes he pushed it up thank you he said and then quite directly are you rich not very said eleanor a little breathless at the blunt query i'm going to be rich said jeff steadily i'm going to be a horse quoth the little eopas the girl retorted saucily though secretly alarmed at the import of this examination exactly so that's settled what is your name hoffman where do you live hoffman eleanor supplemented the girl eleanor then where do you live eleanor in new york just now not in town upstate on a farm you see grandfather's grown old and he wanted father to come back new york's not far said jeff a sudden panic seized the girl what next in swift instinctive self-defence she rose and tripped to the tree where lay her neglected sketch-book bent over and started back with a little cry of alarm with a spring and a rush jeff was at her side caught her up and glared watchfully at bush and shrub and tufted grass mr bransford put me down what was it a rattlesnake a snake what an idea i just noticed how late it was i must go crestfallen sheepishly mr bransford put her down thrust his hands into his pockets tilted his chin and whistled an aggravating little trill from the rye two-step mr bransford said eleanor haughtily mr bransford's face expressed patient attention are you lame mr bransford's eye estimated the distance covered during the recent snake episode and then gave to miss hoffman a look of profound respect his shoulders humped up slightly his head bowed to the stroke he stood upon one foot and traced the rainbow brand in the dust with the other i told you all along i wasn't hurt he said aggrieved didn't i now are you lame she repeated severely ignoring his truthful saying not very the quotation marks were clearly audible are you lame at all uh, no ma'am not what you might call really lame uh, no ma'am and you deceived me like that indignation checked her oh i'm so disappointed in you that was a fine manly thing for you to do it was such a lovely time observed the culprit doggedly and such a chance might never happen again and it isn't my fault i wasn't hurt you know i'm sure i wish i was she gave him an icy glare now see what you've done your men haven't come and you won't stay with mr lake how are you going to get home oh i forgot you can walk as you should have done at first the guilty wretch wilted yet further he shuffled his feet he writhed he positively squirmed he ventured a timid upward glance it seemed to give him courage prompted doubtless by the same feeling which drives one to dive headlong into dreaded cold water he said in a burst of candour 
well you see ma'am that little horse now he really ain't got far he got tangled up over there a ways the girl wheeled and shot a swift startled glance at the little eopus on the hillside who had long since given over his futile struggles and was now nibbling grass with becoming resignation she turned back to bransford slowly scathingly she looked him over from head to foot and slowly back again her expression ran the gamut wonder anger scorn withering contempt i think i hate you she flamed at him amazement triumphed over the other emotions then a real amazement the detected impostor had resumed his former debonair bearing and met her scornful eye with a slow and provoking smile oh no you don't he said reassuringly on the contrary you don't hate me at all i'm going home anyhow she retorted bitterly you may draw your own conclusions still she did not go which possibly had a confusing effect upon his inferences just one minute ma'am if you please how did you know so pat where the little black horse was i didn't tell you little waves of scarlet followed each other to her burning face i'm not going to stay another moment you're detestable and it's nearly sundown oh you needn't hurry it's not far she followed his gesture to her intense mortification she saw the blue smoke of her home campfire flaunting up from a gully not half a mile away it was her turn to droop now she drooped there was a painful silence then in a far-off hard judicial tone how long ma'am if i may ask have you known that the little black horse was tangled up miss eleanor's eyes shifted wildly she broke a twig from a mahogany bush and examined the swelling buds with minutest care well said her ruthless inquisitor sternly since uh, since i went for your hat she confessed in a half whisper to deceive me so pain grief surprise reproach were in his words have you anything to say he added sadly a slender shoe peeped out beneath her denim skirt and tapped on a buried boulder eleanor regarded the toe-tip with interest and curiosity then half audibly we were having such a good time and it might never happen again he captured both her hands she drew back a little ever so little she trembled slightly but her eyes met his frankly and bravely no no not, not now go now mr bransford go at once we will have a pleasant day to remember until the next pleasant day said resolute bransford openly exultant but see here now i can't go to lake's camp or to lake's ball here miss eleanor pouted distinctly or anything that is lake's after your mask ball then what new york but it's only so far on the map she held her hands apart very slightly to indicate the distance on a little map that is i'll drop in saturdays said jeff do i want to hear you sing the rest about the little eopus if you'll sing about sandy suggested jeff why not good-bye now i must go and you won't sing about sandy to anyone else the girl considered doubtfully why i i don't know i've known you for a very little while if you please she gathered up her belongings but we're friends no no said jeff vehemently you won't sing it to anyone else eleanor she drew a line in the dust if you won't cross that line she said i'll tell you mr bransford grasped a sapling with a firm clutch and shook it to try its strength a bird in the bush is the noblest work of god he announced i'll take a chance her eyes were shining you've promised she said she paused when she spoke again her voice was low and a trifle unsteady i won't sing about sandy to anyone else jeff then she fled like lot's wife she looked back from the hillside jeff clung desperately to the sapling with one hand from the other a handkerchief hers fluttered a good-bye message she threw him a farewell with an ambiguous gesture it was late when jeff reached rosebud camp 
the unsaddled nigger baby the little and not entirely gentle black horse rather unobtrusively but johnny dinas sauntered out during the process announcing supper ah sniffed jeff i s'pose i thought you'd wait until i come to get it nothing more alarming than tallies was broached during supper however afterward johnny tilted his chair back and through cigarette smoke contemplated the ceiling with innocent eyes nigger babe looks drawed he suggested uh-huh had one of them poor spells o his puff puff your saddle's a skinned up a heap johnny's look of innocence grew more pronounced how'd you get your clothes so wet rain said jeff puff puff you look right muddy too dust in the air said jeff ah uh, yes silence during the rolling of another cigarette then how'd you get that cut on your head jeff's hand went to his head and felt the bump there he regarded his fingers in some perplexity that oh that's where i bit myself he stalked off to bed in gloomy dignity half an hour later johnny called softly jeff jeff grunted sulkily camping party down near mayhill lot of girls i saw one of em young person with eyes and hair jeff grunted again there was a long silence nice bear there was no answer good old bear said johnny tearfully no answer mr bear if i give you one nice good juicy bite ugh said jeff then said johnny decidedly i'll sleep in the yard End of chapter 3。chapter 4 of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。chapter 4 。the road to Rome。behold one journeyed in the night he sang amid the wind and rain my wet sands gave his feet delight when will that traveller come again。the heart of the road anna hempstead branch a hypotenuse as has been well said is the longest side of a right-angled triangle there is no need for details that we are all familiar with the use of this handy little article is shown by the existence of short cuts at every available opportunity and by keep off of the grass signs in parks now had jeff bransford desired to go to arcadia to that masquerade for instance his direct route from jackson's ranch would have been cater cornered across the desert as has been amply demonstrated by pythagoras and others that jeff did not want to go to arcadia to the masked ball for instance is made apparent by the fact that the afternoon preceding said ball saw him jogging southward toward baird's along the lonely base of that inveterate triangle whereof jackson's baird's and arcadia are the respective corners leaving the fifty-five mile hypotenuse far to his left it was also obvious from the tenor of his occasional self-communings i don't want to make a bally fool of myself do i old grasshopper anyhow you'll be too tired when we get to jean's grasshopper made no response other than a plucky tossing of his bit and a quickening cadence in his rhythmical stride by way of pardonable bravado i never forced myself in where my company wasn't wanted yet and i ain't going to begin now asserted jeff stoutly adding as a fervent afterthought damn lake his way lay along the plain paralleling the long westward range just far enough out to dodge the jutting foothills through bare white levels where grasshoppers hoofs left but a faint trace on the hard glazed earth at intervals tempting crossroads branched away to mountain springs the cottonwood at independent springs came into view round the granite shoulder of strawberry six miles to the right of him he roused himself from prolonged pondering of the marvellous silhouette where san andres unflung in broken masses against the sky to remark in a hushed whisper i wonder if she'd be glad to see me several miles later he quoted musingly for eleanor her christian name was eleanor had twenty-seven different kinds of hell in her after all there are problems which pythagoras never solved the longest road must have an end 
Rich's ranch was passed far to the right, lying low in the long shadow of Kalor, then the mouth of Gambrio Canyon. Far ahead, a shifting flicker of Bear's windmill topped the brush. It grew taller. The upper tower took shape. He dipped into the low, mirage-haunted basin, where the age-old Texas Trail crosses the narrow western corner of the White Sands. When he emerged, the windmill was tall and silver-shining. The low, iron roofs of the house gloomed sullen in the sun. Dust rose from the corral. Now Jeff's ostensible errand to the west side had been the search for strays. Three days before, he had prudently been three days' ride farther to the north. The reluctance with which he had turned back southward was justified by the fact that this critical afternoon found him within striking distance of Arcadia, striking distance, that is, should he care for a bit of hard riding. This was exactly what Jeff had fought against all along. So when he saw the dust, he loped up. It was as he had feared— a band of horses was in the water pen among them a red roan head he knew copperhead of pringle's mount confirmed runaway jeff shut the gate for the first time that day he permitted himself a discreet glance eastward to arcadia three days he said bitterly while grasshopper thrust his eager muzzle into the water trough three days i have braced back my feet and slid like a yearlin on a brandon bee and look at me now oh copperhead you darned old fool see what you done now in this morose mood he went to the house there was no one at home a note was tacked on the door gone to plomo back in two three days beef hangs under platform on windmill tower when you get it oil the mill books and deck of cards in box under bed don't leave fire and stove when you go jean baird n b feed the cat Jeff built a fire in the stove and unsaddled the weary grasshopper. He found some corn, which he put into a woven grass morale, and hung on grasshopper's nose. He went to the water pen, roped out Copperhead, and shut him in a side corral. Then he let the bunch go. They strained through the gate in a mad run, despite shrill and frantic remonstrance from Copperhead. Jeff, said Jeff soberly, are you going to be a damned fool all your life? that girl doesn't care anything about you she hasn't thought of you since you stay right here and read the pretty books that's the place for you this advice was sound and wise beyond cavil so jeff took it valiantly after supper he hobbled grasshopper and took off the nosebag then he went to the back room in pursuit of literature have I leave for a slight digression to commit a long-delayed act of justice to correct a grievous wrong? Oh, thank you. We hear much of Mr. Andrew Carnegie and his libraries, the Hall of Fame, the Little Red Schoolhouse, the Five-Foot Shelf, and the World's Best Books. A singular thing is that the most effective bit of philanthropy along these lines has gone on recorded of a thankless world. This shall no longer be know then that once upon a time a certain soulless corporation rather in the tobacco trade placed in each package of tobacco a coupon each coupon redeemable by one paper-bound book whether they were moved by remorse to this action or by sordid hidden purpose of their own or again by pure disinterested and far-seeing love of their kind is not yet known but the results remain there were three hundred and three volumes on that list, mostly, but not altogether, fiction, and each one was a classic. Classics are cheap. They are not copyrighted. Could I but know the anonymous benefactor who enrolled that glorious company, how gladly would I drop a leaf on his beer or a cherry in his bitters? Thus it was that in one brief decade, the cowboys, with others, became comparatively literate. Cowboys all smoked. Doubtless that was a chief cause contributory to making them the wrecks they were. It destroyed their physique, it corroded and ate away their willpower, leaving them seldom able to work over nineteen hours a day, except in emergencies, prone to abandon a duty in the face of difficulty or danger, when human effort, raised to the nth power, could do no more 
all things considered the most efficient men of their hands on record cowboys all smoked and the most deep-seated instinct of the human race is to get something for nothing they got those books in due course of time they read those books some were slow to take to it but when you stay at lonely ranches when you are left afoot until the water holes dry up so you may catch a horse in the water pen why you must do something the books were read then having acquired the habit they bought more books since the three hundred and three were all real books and since the cowboys had been previously uncorrupted of predigested or sterilized fiction or by gift uplift and helpful books their composite tastes had become surprisingly good and they bought with discriminating care nay more a bookcase follows books a bookcase demands a house a house demands a keeper a housekeeper needs everything hence alfalfa house plants slotless tables bank books the chain which began with yellow coupons ends with christmas trees in some proudest niche in the hall of fame a grateful nation will yet honor that hitherto unrecognized educator franc de boeuf jeff pawed over the tattered yellow-backed volumes in profane discontent he had read them all another box was under the bed behind the first opening it he saw a tangled mass of clothing tumbled in the bachelor manner with the rest a much-used football outfit canvas jacket sweater padded trousers woolen stockings rubber nose guard shin guards ribbed shoes all complete for jean baird was full back of the el paso eleven jeff segregated the gridiron wardrobe with hasty hands his eye brightened he spoke in an awed and almost reverent voice i ain't mostly superstitious but this looks like a leading first i'm here second copperhead's here third no one else is here and for the final miracle here's a costume made to my hand thirty-five miles ten o'clock if i hurry hmm when first i put this uniform on how did that go i'm forgetting all my songs getting old i guess rejecting the heavy shoes as unmeet for waxed floors and the shin guards he rolled the rest of the uniform in his slicker and tied it behind his saddle then he rubbed his chin ah that's a true saying too i am getting old youth turns to youth buck up jeff you old fool have some pride about you and just a little old horse sense yet he unhobbled grasshopper who might then be trusted to find his way to rainbow in about three days he went to the corral and tossed a rope on snorting copperhead no i won't go he said as he slipped on the bridle just to uncock old copperhead i'll make a little horse ride to hospital springs and look through the stock he threw on the saddle with some difficulty copperhead was fat and frisky do you want to see you jeff an old has-been like you no no i'd better not go i won't there if i didn't leave that football stuff on the saddle i'll take it off it might get lost whoa copperhead copperhead however declined to woe on any terms his eyes bulged out he reared he pawed he snorted he bucked he squealed he did anything but woe exasperated jeff caught the bridle by the cheekpiece and swung into the saddle after a few preliminaries in the pitching line jeff started bravely for hospital springs it was destined that this act of renunciation should be thwarted copperhead stopped and dug his feet in the ground as if about to take root jeff dug the spurs home with an agonized ball copperhead made a creditable ascension shook himself and swapped ends before he hit the ground again whoop he said his nose was headed now for arcadia he followed his nose his roan flanks fanned vigorously with a doubled rope headstrong stubborn unmanageable brute oh well have it your own way then you old fool you'll be sorry copperhead leaped out to the loosened rein this is just plain kidnapping said jeff kidnapped and kidnapper were far out on the plain as night came on arcadia road stretched dimly to the east the far lights of la luz flashed through the leftward dusk 
straight before them was a glint and sparkle in the sky faint diffused wavering beyond a warm and mellow glow broke the blackness of the mountain wall where the lights of low-hidden arcadia beat up against rainbow rim jeff was past his first vexation he sang as he rode there was ink on her thumb when i kissed her hand and she whispered if you should die i'll write you an epitaph gloomy and grand time enough for that says i keep a movin here copperhead time fugits right along you will play hooky will you i'm gonna be a horse End of chapter four Chapter Five of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Maskers. For Eleanor, her Christian name was Eleanor, had twenty-seven different kinds of hell in her. Richard Hovey. It lacked little of the eleventh hour when the football player reached the ballroom, last comer to the revels a bandage round his head and a rubber nose-guard which also hid his mouth served for a mask eked out by criss-crossed strips of court plaster one arm was in a sling for stage purposes only as he limped through the door diogenes hurried to meet him held up his lantern peered hopefully into the battered face and shook his disappointed head stung again muttered diogenes jeff lisped in numbers which fully verified the cynic's misgiving seven eleven four eleven forty four he announced jerkily this was strictly in character and also excused him from entangling talk leaving him free to search the whirl of dancers a bulky rough rider volunteered his help he fixed a gleaming eyeglass on his nose and politely offered jeff a big stick by way of a crutch hit the line hard he barked he bit the words off with a prize bulldog effect he had fine teeth jeff waved him off sixteen two one he proclaimed controversially he felt his spirit sinking with a growing doubt of his ability to identify the only one and was impatient of interruption he kept his slow and watchful way down the floor topsy broke away from her partner and stopped jeff's crippled progress her short hair braided to a dozen tight and tiny pigtails bristled away in all directions laws young master you certainly does look puny she said then she clutched at her knee hey she tittered as a loose red stocking dropped flappingly to her ankle pray do not be shocked the effect was startling but a black stocking decorously tight and smooth was beneath the red one jeff's mathematics were not equal to the strain of adequate comment topsy dived to the rescue got a string she giggled as she hitched the fallen stocking back to place can't fix this good nohow jeff jerked his thumb over his shoulder man over there with an eyeglass cord maybe you can get that what makes you act so he looked cold disapproval nevertheless he looked topsy hung her head still clutching at the stocking top dunno i spect it's cause i was so wicked finger in mouth she looked after jeff as he hobbled away a slender witch pounced from a chair and barred his way with a broom her eyes were brimming sorcery her lips looked saucy challenge she leaned close for a whispered word in his ear how would you like to tackle me poor jeff ten two ten two he promised huskily yet he ducked beneath the broom but said the little witch plaintively you're going away she dropped her broom and wept eight two eight two two eight two said jeff almost in tears himself and again fell back upon english mere figures or mere words can't tell you how much i hate to but i've got to follow the ball i'm looking for a fellow if he if he doesn't love you sobbed the stricken witch then you'll come back to me won't you i love a liar to the very stake vowed jeff such heroic if conditional constancy was not to go unrewarded a couple detached themselves from the dancers threaded their way to a corner of the long hall and stood there in deep converse jeff quickened pulse and pace 
for one was a red devil and the other wore the soft grey costume of a friend she was tall this quakeress and the hobnobbing devil was of jeff's own height jeff began to hope for a goal briskly limping he came to this engrossed couple and laid a friendly hand on the devil's shoulder brother he said cordially will you please go to home the devil recoiled an astonished step what what show me your license twenty-three please there's a good devil twenty-three i'm the right guard for this lady i hope oh please to go home the devil took this request in very bad part go back fifteen yards for offside play and take a drop kick at yourself he suggested sourly a burly policeman plainly conscious of fitting his uniform paused for warning no scrappin now just start nothin or i'll run in the three of yes he said and sauntered on twirling a graceful nightstick thee is a local man judging from thy letters said the quaker lady to relieve the somewhat strained situation what do they stand for e p oh yes el paso of course i saw you first said the red devil and with your disposition you would naturally find me more suitable make your choice of gridirons send him back to the sidelines disqualify him for interference don't be hurried into a decision said jeff eternity is a good while before it's over i'm going to be a well something more than a footballer golf maybe or tiddlywinks the quakeress glanced attentively from one to the other doubtless he will do his best to forward thy majesty's interest she interposed why not give him a chance the devil shrugged his shoulders i always prefer to give this branch of work my personal attention he said stiffly a specialty of thine mocked the girl the devil bowed sulkily my heart is in it of course if you prefer the bungling of a novice there is no more to be said thy majesty's manners have never been questioned murmured the quakeress bowing dismissal so kind of you the devil bowed deeply and turned pausing to hurl a gloomy prophecy over his shoulder see you later he said and stalked away with an ill grace pigskin hero and girlfriend left alone eyed each other with mutual apprehension the girlfriend was first to recover speech her red lips were prim below her visor, her eyes downcast to hide their dancing lights. Timidly she spread out fan-wise the dove-color of her sober costume. "'How does thee like my gray gown?' "'Not at all,' said Jeff brutally. "'You're no friend of mine, I hope.' A most unquaker like dimple trembled to her chin, relieving the firm austerity of straight lips. Also Jeff caught a glimpse of her eyes through the visor they were crinkling and they were brown she ventured another tentative remark and there was in it an undertone lingering softly confidential is thee lame not very said jeff and saw a faint colour start to the unmasked moiety of the quaker cheek still if i may have the next dance i shall be glad if you will sit it out with me painfully he raised the beslinged arm in explanation sobra las olas throbbed out its wistful call they set their thought to its haunting measure by all means she took his undamaged arm let us find chairs now there were chairs to the left of them chairs to the right of them chairs vacant everywhere but the gallant six hundred themselves were not more heedless or undismayed than these two still all the world did not wonder on the contrary not even the anxious devil saw them after they passed behind a knot of would-be dancers who were striving to disentangle themselves for seeing traffic thus blocked the policeman rushed to unsnarl the tangle magnificently he flourished his stick he adjured them roughly move on yous move on whereat with one impulse the tangle moved on the copper swept over him engulfed him hustled him to the door and threw him out so screened the chair hunters vanished in far less than a psychological moment for jeff in obedience to a faint or fancied pressure on his arm dived through the portieres into a small room set apart for such as had the heart to prefer cards or chess 
the room was deserted now and there was a broad window open to the night thus thrice favoured of providence they found themselves in the garden chairless but cheerful a garden with one eve is the perfect combination in a world awry muffled the music and the sounds of the ballroom came faint and far to them star-made shadows danced at their feet the girl paused expectant but it was the unexpected that happened the nimble tongue which had done such faithful service for mr bransford now failed him quite left him struggling dumb inarticulate helpless tongue and hand alike forgetful of their cunning be sure the maid had adroitly heard much of mr bransford his deeds and misdeeds during the tedious interval since their first meeting report had dwelt lovingly upon mr bransford's eloquence at need this awkward silence was a tribute of sincerity above question with difficulty eleanor mastered a wild desire to ask where the cat had gone oh come ye in peace here or come ye in war such injudicious quotation trembled on the tip of her tongue but she suppressed it barely in time she felt herself growing nervous with the fear lest she should be hurried into some all too luminous speech and still jeff stood there lost speechless helpless unready a clumsy oath an object of pity pity at last or a kindred feeling drove her to the rescue and just as she had feared she said in her generous haste far too much i thought you were not coming the inflection made a question of this statement also by implication it answered so many questions yet unworded that jeff was able to use his tongue again but it was not the trusty tongue of yore witness this wooden speech you mean you thought i said i wasn't coming don't you you knew i would come indeed how should i know what you would do i've only seen you once aren't you forgetting that why else did you make up as a friend then oh oh dear these men there's conceit for you i chose my costume solely to trap mr branford's eye is that it doubtless all my thoughts have centred on mr branford since i first saw him you know i didn't mean that miss eleanor i miss hoffman if you please miss hoffman don't be mean to me i've only got an hour an hour do you imagine for one second why i mustn't stay here this is really a farewell dance given in my honour we go back east to-day after to-morrow i must go in only one little hour and i have come a long way for my hour they take their masks off at midnight don't they and of course i can't stay after that i want only just to ask you why did you come then isn't it rather unusual to go uninvited to a ball why i reckon you nearly know why i came miss hoffman but if you want me to say precisely ma'am i don't we'll keep that for a surprise then another thing i wanted to find out just where you live in new york i forgot to ask you and i couldn't very well go round asking folks after you're gone could i of course i didn't have any invitation from mr lake but i thought if he didn't know it he wouldn't mind me just stepping in to get your address well of all the assurance said miss eleanor do you intend to start up a correspondence with me without even the formality of asking my consent why miss eleanor ma'am i thought miss hoffman sir yes and there's another thing you said you had no invitation from mr lake does that mean by any chance that i invited you you didn't say a word about my coming said jeff he was a flustered man this poor bransford but he managed to put a slight stress upon the word say miss eleanor uh, miss hoffman caught this faint emphasis instantly oh i didn't say anything i just looked an invitation i suppose she stormed melting eyes and that sort of thing tears in them maybe poor girl poor little child it would be cruel to let her go home without seeing me again i will give her a little more happiness poor thing and write to her a while maybe it would be wiser though just to make a quarrel and break loose at once she'll get over it in a little while after she gets back to new york well upon my word as she advanced these horrible suppositions miss hoffman had marked out a short beat of garden path 
five steps and a turn five steps back and whirl again with on the whole a caged tigress effect with a double quick at each turn to keep his place at her elbow jeff utterly aghast at the damnable perversity of everything on earth vainly endeavoured to make coordinate and stumbling remonstrance as she stopped for breath jeff heard his own voice at last propounding to the world at large a stunned query as to whether the abode of lost spirits could afford aught to excel the present situation the remark struck him he paused to wonder what other things he had been saying miss eleanor walked her beat vindictive her chin was at an angle of complacency she turned up the perky corners of an imaginary moustache with an air an exasperating little finger separated from the others pointing upward in hateful self-satisfaction her mouth wore a gratified masculine smirk visible even in the starlight her gait was a leisured and lordly strut her hand waved airy pity jeff shrank back in horror m m m miss hoffman i n n n never d d dream miss hoffman turned upon him swiftly never have i heard anything like it never you bring me out here willy-nilly and by way of entertainment you virtually accuse me of throwing myself at your head i never said jeff indignantly i didn't miss hoffman faced him crouchingly and shook an indictment from her fingers first you imply that i enticed you to come second expecting you i dressed to catch your eye third i was watching eagerly for you oh come i say now the baited and exasperated victim walked headlong into the trap the first thing you did was to ask me if i was lame wasn't that question meant to find out who i was when i answered not very didn't you know at once that it was me there that proves exactly what i was just saying raged the delighted trapper you don't even deny it you say in so many words that i have been courting you i had to say something didn't i you wouldn't you were limping so i asked you if you were lame what else could i have said did you want me to stand there like a stuffed egyptian mummy that's the thanks a girl gets for trying to help a great awkward blundering butterfingers oh if you could just see yourself the irresistible conqueror not altogether unprincipled though you are capable of compunction i'll give you credit for that alarmed at your easy success you try to spare me it is noble of you noble you drag me out here force a quarrel upon me oh by jove now really stung by the poignant injustice of crowding events jeff took the bit in his teeth and rushed to destruction really you must see yourself that i couldn't drag you out here i've never been in that hall before i didn't know the lay of the ground i didn't even know that little side room was there i thought you pressed my arm a little so the brainless colt in the quicksands flounders deeper with each effort to extricate himself if miss hoffman had been angry before she was furious now so that's the way of it better and better i dragged you out really mr bransford i feel that i should take you back to your chaperone at once you might be compromised you know goaded to desperation he acted on this hint at once he turned with stiff and stilted speech i will take you back to the window miss hoffman then there is nothing for me to do but go i am sorry to have caused you even a moment's annoyance to-morrow you will see how you have twisted i mean how completely you have misinterpreted everything i have said perhaps some day you may forgive me here is the window good night good-bye miss hoffman lingered however of course if you apologize i do miss hoffman i beg your pardon most sincerely for anything i have ever said or done that could hurt you in any way if you are sure you are sorry if you take it all back and will never do such a thing again perhaps i may forgive you i won't i am i will said the abject and grovelling wretch which was incoherent but pleasing i didn't mean anything the way you took it but i'm sorry for everything then i didn't beguile you to come or mask as a friend in the hope that you would identify me no no 
miss eleanor pressed her advantage cruelly nor take stock of each new masker to see if he possibly wasn't the expected mr bransford nor drag you into the garden nor squeeze your arm her hands went to her face her lissom body shook oh mr bransford she sobbed between her fingers how could you how could you say that the clock chimed a pealing voice beat out into the night masks off a hundred voices swelled the cry it was drowned in waves of laughter it rose again tumultuously masks off masks off nearer came hateful voices too that cried eleanor eleanor where are you i must go said jeff they'll be looking for you no you didn't do any of those things you couldn't do any of those things good-bye eleanor eleanor hoffman where are you miss hoffman whipped off her mask from the open window a shaft of light fell on her face it was flushed sparkling radiant masks off she said stupid oh you great goose of course i did she stepped back into the shadow no one as the copybook says justly may be always wise conversely the most unwise of us blunders sometimes upon the right thing to do with a glimmer of returning intelligence mr bransford laid his nose guard on the window-sill sir said eleanor then how dare you then she turned the other cheek good-bye she whispered and fled away to the ballroom mr bransford in the shadows scratched his head dubiously her christian name was eleanor he muttered eleanor mm, eleanor very appropriate name a very and i don't know yet where she lives he wandered disconsolately away to the garden wall forgetting the discarded nose guard end of chapter five chapter six of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the isle of arcady then the moon shone out so broad and good that the barn fowl crowed and the brown owl called to his mate in the wood that a dead man lay in the road will wallace harney arcadia's assets were the railroad two large modern sawmills the climate and printer's ink the railroad found it a patch of bare ground six miles from water put in successively a whistling post a signboard a depot townsite papers and a water main from the alamo and when the townsite papers were confirmed established machine shops and made the new town the division headquarters and base for northward building the railroad then set up the sawmills primarily to get out ties and timbers for its own lanky growth and built a spur to bring the forest down from the rainbow to the mills the word down is used advisedly arcadia nestled on the plain under the very eave spouts of rainbow range the branch following with slavish fidelity the lines of a twisted corkscrew took twenty-seven miles mostly tunnel and trestle work to clamber to the logging camps with the minimum grade that was purely prohibitive and a maximum that i dare not state but there was a rise of six thousand feet in those twenty-seven miles you can figure the average for yourself and if the engine should run off the track at the end of her climb she would light on the very roundhouse where she took breakfast and spoiled the shingles yes that was some railroad there was a summer hotel cloudland on the summit largely occupied by slack wire performers others walked up or rode a horse they used stem winding engines with eight vertical cylinders on the right side and a shaft like a steamboat with beveled cogwheel transmission on the axles and they haven't had a wreck on that branch to date no matter how late a train is when an engine sees the tail lights of her caboose ahead of her she stops and sends out flagmen the railroad under the pseudonym of the arcadia development company also laid out streets and laid in a network of pipelines and staked out lots until the sawmill protested for lack of tie timber it put down miles of cement walks fringed them with cottonwood saplings telephone poles and electric lights 
it built a hotel and a few streets of party-coloured cottages directoire with lingerie tile roofs organdy facades and peplum intersecting panels and outside chimneys at the gable ends it decreed a park with nooks lanes mazes lake swans ball ground grandstand bandstand and the band appertaining thereunto all of which apparently came into being overnight then it employed a competent staff of word artists and capitalized the climate the result was astonishing the cottonwoods grew apace and a swift town grew with them swift in every sense of the word it took good money to buy good lots in arcadia people with money must be fed served and amused by people wanting money in three years the trees cast a pleasant shade and the company cast a balance with gratifying results they discounted the unearned increment for a generation to come it was a beneficent scheme selling ozone and novelty sunshine and delight the buyers got far more than the worth of their money the company got their money and everyone was happy health and good spirits are a bargain at any price there were sandstorms and hot days but sand promotes digestion and digestion promotes cheerfulness heat merely enhanced the luxury of shaded hammocks as an adventurer thought out he sent for seven others worse than himself arcadia became the metropolis of the county and by special election the county seat courthouse college and jail followed in quick succession for the company arcadia life was one grand sweet song with thus far but a single discord as has been said arcadia was laid out on the plain there was higher ground on three sides rainbow mountain to the east the deltas of la cruz creek and the alamo to the north and south new mexico was dry as a rule after the second exception when enthusiastic citizens went about on stilts to forward a project for changing the town's name to venice the company acknowledged its error handsomely when dry land prevailed once more above the face of the waters it built a mighty moat by way of the amenda honorable a moat with its one embankment on the inner side of the five-mile horseshoe about the town this with its attendant bridges gave to arcadia an aspect singularly medieval it also furnished a convenient line of social demarcation chauffeurs college professors lawyers gamblers county officers together with a few tradesmen and railroad officials abode within the isle of arcady on more or less even terms with the arcadian propers millmen railroaders lumberjacks and the underworld generally dwelt without the pale the company rubbed its lamp again and behold an armory a hospital and a library it contributed liberally to churches and campaign funds it exercised a general supervision over morals and manners for example in the deed to every lot sold was an ironclad fire-tested automatic and highly constitutional forfeiture clause to the effect that sale or storage on the premises of any malt venous or spiritus lectors should immediately cause the title to revert to the company the company's own vicarious saloon on lot number one was a sumptuous and magnificent affair it was known as the mint all this while we have been trying to reach the night watchman in the early youth of arcadia there came to her borders a warlock finn of ruddy countenance and solid build he had a finnish name and they called him lars persina Lars P. had been a seafaring man. While spending a year's wage in San Francisco, he had wandered into Arcadia by accident. There, being unable to find the sea, he became a lumberjack, with a custom, when in spirits, of beating the watchman of that date into an omelette. The indulgence of this penchant gave occasion for much adverse criticism fine and imprisonment failed to deter him from this playful habit 
one watchman tried to dissuade lars from his foible with a club and his successor even went so far as to shoot him to shoot lars p of course not his predecessor the successor's predecessor not lars persinus if he ever had one which he hadn't what we need is more pronouns he the successor of the predecessor resigned when lars became convalescent but lars was no whit dismayed by this contretemps in his first light-hearted moment he resumed his old amusement with unabated gaiety thus was one of our greatest railroad systems subjected to embarrassment and annoyance by the idiosyncrasies of an ignorant but cheerful sailor-man the railroad resolved to submit no longer to such caprice a middleweight of renown was imported who when he was able to be about again bitterly reproached the president and demanded a bonus on the ground that he had knocked lars down several times before he lars got angry and also because of a disquisition in the finnish tongue which lars persina had emitted during the procedure which address the prize-fighter stated had unnerved him and so led to his undoing it was obviously he said of a nature inconceivably insulting the memory of it rankled yet though he had heard only the beginning and did not get the but let that pass the thing became a scandal watchman succeeded watchman on the company payroll and the hospital list until some one hit upon a happy and ingenious way to avoid this indignity lars porcina was appointed watchman this statesmanlike policy bore gratifying results lars porcina straightway abandoned his absurd and indefensible custom and no imitator arose also arcadia within the moat the island which was the limit of his jurisdiction became the most orderly spot in new mexico in the first gray of dawn uncle sam whistling down main street on his way home from the masquerade found lars porcina lying on his face in a pool of blood the belated reveller knelt beside him the watchman was shot but still breathed oh murder help murder shouted uncle sam the alarm rolled crashing along the quiet street heads were thrust from windows startled voices took up the outcry other home-goers ran from every corner hastily arrayed householders poured themselves from street doors lars persina was in a disastrous plight he breathed but that was about all he was shot through the body a trail of blood led back a few doors to lake's bank a window was cut out the blood began at the sill messengers ran to telephone the doctor the sheriff lake the knot of men grew to a crowd a rumor spread that there had been an unusual amount of currency in the bank overnight a rumor presently confirmed by bassett the bareheaded and white-faced cashier it was near payday in addition to the customary amount to cash checks for railroaders and mill hands itself no mean sum and the money for regular business there had been provision for contemplated loans to promoters of new local industries the doctor came running made a hasty examination took emergency measures to stanch the freshly started blood and swore wholeheartedly at the ambulance and the crowding arcadians he administered a stimulant lars porcina fluttered his eyes weakly stand back you idiots bash those fools faces in for em some one said the medical man he bent over the watchman who did it lars lars made a vain effort to speak the doctor gave him another sip of restorative and took a pull himself try again old man you're badly hurt and you may not get another chance did you know him lars gathered all his strength to a broken speech N -n -n no bank found window midnight nearly shot me didn't see him he fell back on uncle sam's starry vest ambulance coming said uncle sam will he live doc doc shook his head doubtfully poor chance lost too much blood if he'd been found in time he might have pulled through wonderful vitality ought to be dead by now by the books still there's a chance 
i never thought said uncle sam to cyrano de bergerac as the ambulance bore away its unconscious burden that i would ever be so sorry at anything that could happen to lars porcina after the way he made me stop singing on my own birthday he was one grand old fighting machine End of chapter six Chapter Seven of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven States General. And they hae killed Sir Charlie Hay and laid the white on Geordie. Old Ballad. That the master's eye is worth two servants had ever been Lake's favorite maxim. He had not yet gone to bed when the message reached him where he kept his masterly eye on the proper closing up of the ballroom he came through the crowd now shouldering his way roughly still in his police costume helmet tunic and belt in his wake came the sheriff who had just arrived scorching to the scene on his trusty wheel on the bank steps lake turned his face to the crowd his strong canine jaw was set to stubborn fighting lines the helmet did not wholly hide the black frown or the swollen veins at his temple come in thompson and help the sheriff size the thing up and you alec he stabbed the air at his choice with a strong blunt finger and turnbull you clark and you bassett you keep the door admit no one lake was the local great man never had he appeared to such advantage to his admirers never had his ascendancy seemed so unquestioned and so justified as he stood beside the sheriff in the growing light the man was the incarnation of power the power of wealth position prestige success in this moment of yet unplumbed disaster taken by surprise summoned from a night of crowded pleasure he held his mastery chose his men and measures with unhesitant decision planned ordered kept to that blunt direct speech of his that wasted no word a buzz went up from the unadmitted as the door swung shut behind him lake had chosen well arcadia in epitome was within those pillaged walls thompson was president of the rival bank alec was division superintendent turnbull was the mill master clark was editor of the arcadian day clark had been early to the storm centre yet of all the investigators clark alone was not more or less dishevelled he was faultlessly apparelled even to the long prince albert and black string tie in which indeed report said he slept so much for capital industry and the fourth estate the last of the probers whom lake had drafted merely by the slighting personal pronoun you was nevertheless identifiable in private life by the name of billy white being indeed none other than our old friend the devil his indigenous moustache still retained a mephistophelian twist he was becomingly arranged in slippers pyjamas and a pink bathrobe girdled at the waist with a most unhermit-like cord having gone early and surly to bed in this improvised committee he fitly represented society while the sheriff represented society at large and ex officio that incautious portion under duress yet one element was unrepresented for lake made a mistake which other great men have made of failing to reckon with the masterless men who dwell without the wall lake led the way will the watchman die alec do you think whispered billy as they filed through the grilled door to the counting-room don't know hope not game old rooster good watchman too said turnbull the mill superintendent lake turned on the lights the wall safe was blown open fragments of the door were scattered among the overturned chairs in an open recess in the vault there was a dull yellow mass the explosion had spilled the front rows of coins to a golden heap behind some golden rouleaux were intact others tottered precariously as you have perhaps seen beautiful tall stacks of coloured counters do gold pieces were strewn along the floor thank god they didn't get all the gold anyhow said lake with a sigh of relief 
then of course they didn't touch the silver but there was a lot of greenbacks over twenty-five thousand i think bassett will know and i don't know how much gold is gone look around and see if they left anything incriminating sheriff anything that we can trace em by he heard poor old lars coming said the sheriff then after he shot him he hadn't the nerve to come back for the gold this strikes me as being a bungler's job must have used an awful lot of dynamite to tear that door up like that funny no one heard the explosion can't be much of your gold gone lake that compartment is pretty nearly as full as it will hold or heard him shoot our watchman suggested thompson still i don't know there's blasting going on in the hills all the time and almost every one was at the masquerade or else asleep how many times did they shoot old lars does anybody know is there any idea what time it was done he was shot once right here said alec indicating the spot on the flowered silk that had been part of his mandarin's dress a gun was held so close it burnt his shirt awful hole don't believe the old chap will make it he crawled along toward the telephone station till he dropped say central must have heard that shot it's only two blocks away she ought to be able to tell what time it was lars said it was just before midnight said clark oh did he speak asked lake how many robbers were there did he know any of em he didn't see anybody shot just as he reached the window hope someone hangs for this said clark lake i wish you'd have this money picked up i'm not used to walking on gold or else have me watched lake shook his head angry at the untimely pleasantry it was a pleasantry in effect only put forward to hide uneditorial agitation and distress for lars porcina lake's undershot jaw thrust forward he fingered the blot of whisker at his ear it was a time for action not for talk he began his campaign look here sheriff you ought to wire up and down the line to keep a lookout hold all suspicious characters then get a posse to ride for some sign around the town if we only had something to go on some clue later we'll look through this town with a fine-tooth comb most likely they or he if there was only one won't risk staying here first of all i've got to telegraph to el paso for money to stave off a run on the bank you'll help me thompson of course my burglar insurance will make good my loss or most of it but that'll take time we mustn't risk a run people lose their heads so i'll give you a statement for the day clark as soon as i find out where mr thompson stands i will back you up sir with the bulk of depositors money loaned out no bank however solvent can withstand a continued run without backing i shall be glad to tide you over if only for my own protection a panic is contagious thanks said lake shortly interrupting this stately financial discourse then we shall do nicely let's see to-morrow's payday you fellows he turned briskly to the two superintendents can't you hold up your payday say until saturday stand your men off the company stands good for their money they can wait a while oh no need to do that said alec i'll have the railroad checks drawn on st louis the storekeepers'll cash them if necessary i'll wire for authority to let turnbull pay off the mill hands with railroad checks it's just taking money from one pocket to put in the other anyhow then that's all right now for the robbers the banker's face betrayed impatience my first duty was to protect my clients but now we'll waste no more time you gentlemen make a close search for any possible scrap of evidence while the sheriff and i write our telegrams i must wire the burglar insurance company too he plunged a pen into an inkwell and fell to work acting upon this hint the sheriff took a desk wish phillips was here my deputy he sighed i've sent for him he's got a better head than i have for noticing clues and things this was eminently correct as well as modest the sheriff was a simon pure arcadian the company's nominee his deputy was a concession to the disgruntled hinterland where the unobservant rarely reach maturity oh alec said lake over his shoulder you sit down too and wire all your conductors about their passengers last night yes and the freight crews too we'll rush those through first and can't you scare up another operator 
his pen scratched steadily over the paper more apt to be some of our local outlaws though in that case it will be easier to find their trail they'll probably be on horseback you were an old-timer yourself weren't you not asked billy amiably if the robbers are frontiersmen they may be easier to get track of as you suggest but won't they be harder to get billy spoke languidly the others were searching assiduously for clues in the most approved manner but billy sprawled easily in a chair we'll get em if we can find out who they were snapped lake setting his strong jaw he did not particularly like billy especially since their late trip to rainbow there never was a man yet so good but there was one just a little better by a good man in this connection you mean a bad man i presume said billy in a meditative drawl were you a good man before you became a banker look here what's this the interruption came from clark he pounced down among two fragments of the safe door and brought up an object which he held to the light at the startled tones lake spun around in a swivel chair he held out his hand really i don't think i ever saw anything like this thing before he said any of you know what it is it's a nose guard said billy billy was a college man and had worn a nose piece himself he frowned unconsciously remembering his successful rival of the masquerade a nose guard what for you wear it to protect your nose and teeth when you're playing football explained billy keeps you from swearing too you hold this piece between your teeth and the other part goes over your nose up between your eyes and fastens with this band around your forehead why why gasped clark there was a man at the masquerade togged out as a football player i saw him said alec and he wore one of these things i saw him talking to topsy one of my guests demanded lake scoffingly oh nonsense some young fella has been in here yesterday talking to the clerks and dropped it who went as a football player white you know all these college boys know anything about this one not a thing there billy lied a prompt and loyal gentleman reasoning that budinsky as he mentally styled the interloper who had misappropriated the quaker lady would have cared nothing at that time for a paltry thirty thousand thus was he guilty of a practice against which we are all vainly warned of judging others by ourselves billy remembered very distinctly that miss eleanor had not reappeared until the midnight unmasking and he therefore acquitted her companion of this particular crime entirely without prejudice to budinsky's felonious instincts in general for the watchman had been shot before midnight billy made a tentative mental decision that this famous nose guard had been brought to the bank later and left there purposely and he resolved to keep his eye open oh well it's no great difference anyhow said lake whoever it was dropped it here yesterday i guess and got another one for the masquerade hold on there said clark holding the spotlight tenaciously that don't go this thing was on top of one of those pieces of the safe for the first time lake was startled from his iron composure are you sure he demanded jumping up sure it was right here against the sloping side of this piece so that puts a different light on the case gentlemen said lake luck is with us and and while i think of it said clark making the most of this unexpected opportunity i made notes of all the costumes and their wearers after the masks were off for the paper you know and i saw no football player there i remember that distinctly i only saw him the one time confirmed alec and i stayed almost to the break-up whoever it was he left early but what possible motive could the robber have for going to the dance at all queried lake in perplexity maybe he made his appearance there in a football suit purposely so as to leave us some one to hunt for and then committed the robbery and went back in another costume suggested clark pleased and not a little surprised at his own ingenuity in that case he would have left this rubber thing here of design hmm lake was plainly struck with this theory and that's not such a bad idea either we'll look into this football matter after breakfast you'll go to the hotel with me gentlemen our womankind are all asleep after the ball the sheriff will send someone to guard the bank meanwhile i'll call the cashier in and find out exactly how much money we're short send bassett in will you billy you stay at the door and keep that mob out
End of chapter 7chapter eight of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight arcades ambo what means this my lord mary this is milching malatio it means mischief hamlet we are not here to do what service we may for honour and not for hire robert louis stevenson with billy went the sheriff and alec the latter with a sheaf of telegrams now how did Badinsky's nose guard get into this bank that's what i'd like to know said billy to the doorknob when the other committeemen had gone their ways i didn't bring it i don't believe Badinsky did and policeman lake certainly saw us quarrelling he noticed the football player right enough and he pretends he didn't why 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 does policeman lake pretend he didn't see that football player echo answers oh, why denmark's all putrefied the low sun cleared the housetops the level rays fell along the window-sill and billy staring fascinated at the single blotch of dried blood on the inner sill saw something glitter and sparkle there beside it he went closer it was a dust of finely powdered glass billy whistled a light foot ran up the steps there was a rap at the door no entrance except on business no business transacted here quoted billy startled from a deep study a head appeared at the window oh it's you jimmy that's different come in it was jimmy phillips the chief deputy billy knew him and liked him he unbarred the door well anything turned up yet demanded jimmy i stopped in to see lars him and me was old side partners how's he making it jimmy oh doc said he had one chance and ten thousand so he's all right i guess responded that brisk optimist they got any theory about the robber they have that a perfectly sound theory too only it isn't true said billy in a low and guarded tone they'll tell you i haven't got time see here if i give you the straight tip will you work it up and keep your head closed until you see which way the cat jumps can you keep it to yourself mum as a sack of clams said jimmy look at this a minute billy pointed to the tiny particles of glass on the inner sill got that then i'll dust it off this is a case for your gummiest shoes now look at this he indicated the opening where the patch of glass had been cut from the big pane jimmy rubbed his finger very cautiously along the raw edge of glass cut out from the inside then carried out there a frame up exactly but i don't want anybody else to size it up for a frame-up not now but said jimmy good-naturedly i'd a seen all that myself after a little if you hadn't a showed me yes said billy dryly and then told somebody that's why i brushed the glass dust off i've got inside information some that i'm going to share with you and some that i am not going to tell even you trot it out lake had the key of this front door in the policeman's uniform that he wore to the dance isn't that queer if i were you i'd very quietly find out whether he went home to get that key after he got word that the bank was robbed he was still in the ballroom when he got the message you think it's a put-up job why there is something not just right about the man lake his mind is too ball-bearing altogether he herds those chumps in there round like so many sheep he used em to make discoveries with and then showed em how to force em on him oh they made a heap of progress they've got evidence enough up in there to hang john the baptist with lake all the time setting back in the breeching like a bulky horse it's lake's bank and the bank's got burglar's insurance got that if he gets the money and the insurance too see and i happen to know that he has been bucking the market i dropped a roll with him myself then there's a revenge as they say on the stage and something else beside has lake any bitter enemies oodles of em but one worse than the others one he hates most jimmy thought for a while and then he nodded jeff bransford i reckon is he in town not that i know of well i never heard of your mr bransford but he's in town all right all right 
you see link's got a case cooked up that'll hang someone higher than amon and i'll bet the first six years of my life against a dr cook lecture ticket that the first letter of someone's name is jeff bransford maybe jeff can prove he was somewhere else suggested jimmy billy evaded the issue what sort of a man is this bransford any good besides being an enemy of lakes i mean mr bransford is one whom we all delight to humor announced the deputy after some reflection friend of yours jimmy reflected again well yes he said he limps a little in the cold weather and i got a little small ditch ploughed in my skull but our horses was both young and wild and the boys rode in between us before there was any harm done i pulled him out of the pecos since that too and poured some several barrels of water out of him yes we're good friends i reckon he'll shoot back on proper occasion then a good sport stand the gaff on proper occasion enjoined jimmy the other man will shoot back if he's lucky yes sir jeff certainly won dead game sport at any turn in the road considering the source and spirit of your information you sadden me said billy the better man he is the better chance to hang has he got any close friends here he seldom ever comes here said jimmy all his friends is on rainbow especially south rainbow but his particular side partners is all away just now leastways all but one can't you write to that one the deputy grinned hugely and tell him to come break jeff out of jail said he that don't seem hardly right considerin you write to him johnny deanus morningside you might wire up to cloudland and have it forwarded from there i'll pay billy made a note of it they'll be out here in a jiffy now he said now jimmy you listen to all they tell you follow it up make no comments don't see anything and don't miss anything let lake think he's having it all his own way and he'll make some kind of a break that will give him away we haven't got a thing against him yet except the right guess and you be careful to catch your friend without a fight when you get him i want you to give him a message from me but don't mention any name tell him to keep a stiff upper lip that the devil takes care of his own say the devil told you himself in person i don't want you to show my hand i'm on the other side see that way i can be in lake's councils force myself in if necessary after this morning you think that if you give lake rope enough exactly here they come i hear their chairs blonde or brunette said jimmy casually now eh, what's that the something else that you wouldn't tell me about jimmy explained is she blonde or brunette oh go to hell said billy End of chapter eight Chapter nine of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine Taken Lord Huntley, then he did speak out. O oh, fair Mortva his body, I here will fight double de lane, or anything else, Geordie. Whom has he robbed? What has he stole? Or has he killed Arnie? or what's the crime that he has done his foes they are so many old ballad hue and cry hubbub and mystery swept the isle of arcady that morning but the most painstaking search and query proved fruitless it developed beyond doubt that the football man had not been seen since his one brief appearance on the ballroom floor search was transferred to the mainland where as it neared noon lake's perseverance and thoroughness were rewarded in chihuahua suburb beyond the north wall lake noted a sweat-marked red roan horse in the yard of rosalio marquez better known by reason of his profession as monte straightway the banker reported this possible clue to the sheriff and to billy who was as tireless and determined in the chase as lake himself the other masqueraders had mostly abandoned the chase he found them on the bridge of the la luz sallyport it may be worth looking into lake advised the sheriff better send someone to reconnoitre someone not known to be connected with your office you go billy if you find anything suspicious the sheriff can phone to the hospital if he needs me i'm going over to see how the old watchman is 
ought to have gone before if he gets well i must do something handsome for him billy fell in with this request he had a well-founded confidence in lake's luck and attached much more significance to the trifling matter of the red roan horse than did the original discoverer especially since the discoverer had bethought himself to go to the hospital on an errand of mercy billy now confidently expected early developments and he preferred personally to conduct the arrest so that he might interfere if necessary to prevent any wasting of good cartridges he did not expect much trouble however providing the affair was conducted tactfully reasoning that a dead game sport with a clean conscience and a light heart would not seriously object to a small arrest poor billy's own heart was none of the lightest as he went on this loyal service to his presumably favoured rival bicycle back he accompanied the sheriff beyond the outworks to the mexican quarter near the place indicated by the banker billy left his wheel and strolled casually round the block he saw the red roan steed and noted the double rainbow branded on his thigh monty was leaning in the adobe doorway rolling a cigarette billy knew him in a business way hello monty good horse you got there yes it's nice horse said monty want to sell him he's no my horse explained monty he's of a friend i like his looks said billy is your friend here or if he's downtown what's his name i'd like to buy that horse he is within but he's not apparent he is a dormindo oh, yes a sleeping it was last night to the bell mascarada billy nodded yes i was there myself he decided to take a risk assuming that his calculations were correct x must equal bransford so he said carelessly let's see bransford went as a sailor didn't he un marinero oh no he was a tired like one uh, ke, cos, uh, what you call these thing uh, on a ballon par a juge on los pieds oh si si one feet ball myself i come soon back i have no business the best people leaves all for the dance said monty with hand turned up and the shrugging shoulder do media noche twelve of the clock i am here back i find here the horse of my friend and one got a letter that i am not to lock the door porque he may come to a sleep so i meek to repose myself later i am aroused when my friend am to retire himself ah que hombre i am not to a smile to see him in these so ridiculous vestidos he is a poor gay ah que jeff in all ways this is a man ver suficiente courageous a strong formidable yet he is keep the disposition the heart of a simple little child on a muchacho i'll come again said billy and passed on he had found out what he had come for the absence of concealment dispelled any lingering doubt of jeff butinsky yet he could establish no alibi by monte perhaps billy white may require here a little explanation all things considered billy thought jeff would be better off in jail with a friend in the opposite camp working for his interest than getting himself foolishly killed by a hasty posse if we are cynical we may say that being young billy was not averse to the role of deus ex machina perhaps a thought of friendly gratitude was not lacking then too adventure for adventure's sake is motive enough in youth or as a final self-revelation we may hint that if jeff was a rival so too was lake and one more eligible let us not be cynical however or cowardly let us say at once shamelessly what we very well know that youth is the season for clean honour and high emprise that boy's love is best and truest of all that poor honest billy in his own dogged and fantastic way but sought to give true service where he loved there we have said it and we are shamed how old are you sir forty fifty most actions are the result of mixed motives you say well that is a notable concession at your age let it go at that billy then acted from mixed motives 
when billy brought back his motives and the sheriff monte still held his negligent attitude in the doorway he waved a graceful salute i want to see bransford said the sheriff he is asleeping said monte well i want to see him anyway the sheriff laid a brusque hand on the gate latch monte waved his cigarette airily flicked the ash from the end with a slender finger and once more demonstrated that the hand is quicker than the eye the portentously steady gun in the hand was the first intimation to the eye that the hand had moved at all it was a very large gun as to caliber the sheriff noted as it was pointed directly at his nose he was favorably situated to observe looking along the barrel that the hammer stood at full cock perhaps you have some papers for him suggested monty with gentle and delicate deference he still leaned against the door jamb but if not it is best that you do not enter these my little house to disturb my guest that would be to commit a rudeness no the sheriff was a sufficiently brave man if not precisely a brilliant one yet he showed now intelligence of the highest order he dropped the latch you billy stop your laughing do you know mr monte i think you are quite right he observed with a smiling politeness equal to monte's own that would be rude certainly my mistake an englishman's house is his castle that sort of thing if you will excuse me now we will go and get the papers as you so kindly pointed out they went away the sheriff billy and motives billy still laughing immoderately monte went inside and stirred up his guest with a prodding boot toe meester jeff he demanded what you been a doin now jeff sat up rumpled his hair and rubbed his eyes sleepin he said and before poke the sheriff he has been to make a rest of you i think me said jeff rubbing his chin thoughtfully i haven't done anything that i can remember now sure no small little crime not last night me i just got up i have not here jeff considered this suggestion carefully no i am sure not for years some mistake i guess or maybe he just wanted to see me about something else why didn't he come in i me class of him that he do not said monte i see jeff laughed come on we'll go see him you don't want to get into trouble they crossed the bridge and met the sheriff just within the fortifications returning in a crowded automobile jeff held up his hand the machine stopped and the posse deployed except billy who acted as chauffeur you wanted to see me sheriff at the hotel why yes if you don't mind said the sheriff good dinner i ain't had breakfast yet first class said the sheriff cordially won't your friend come too ah signor you ashamed me that i am not so hospitable is it not purred monte as he followed jeff into the tonneau the sheriff reddened and billy choked nothing of the sort said the sheriff hastily lapsing into literalness you were quite within your rights for that matter i know you were at your own bank dealing when the crime was committed i am holding you for the present as a possible accessory but if not then as a material witness by the way monty would you mind if i sent some men to look through your place there is a matter of some thirty thousand dollars missing lake asks us to look for it i have papers for it if you care to see em oh no signor said monty he handed over a key la casa è suya thank you said the sheriff with unmoved gravity anything of yours you want em to bring bransford why no said jeff cheerfully i've got nothing there but my saddle my gun and an old football suit that belongs to jean baird over on the west side but if you want me to stay long i wish you'd look after my horse i do have leave there my gun i keep to protect my little house observed monte tell them one to keep it for me i'm much attached to that gun why yes i've seen that gun i think said the sheriff they'll look out for it all right billy the car turned back oh you were speaking about monte being an accessory i didn't get in till way past night and i've been asleep all day said jeff apologetically might i ask before or after exactly what fact monte was an accessory bank robbery for one thing ah that would be lake's bank anything else the sheriff was not a patient man and he had borne much 
also he liked lars porcina perfection even in trifles is rare and wins affection he turned on jeff with an angry growl murder lake murmured jeff hopefully the sheriff continued ignoring and indeed only half sensing the purport of jeff's comment at least the wound may not be mortal that's too bad said jeff he was if possible more cheerful than ever the sheriff glared at him billy from the front seat threw a word of explanation over his shoulder it's not lake the watchman oh old lars porcina that's different not a bad sort lars maybe he'll get well hope so and i shot him dear me when did it happen you'll find out soon enough said the sheriff grimly your preliminaries right away hell i haven't had breakfast yet jeff protested feed us first or we won't be tried at all within the jail while the sheriff spoke with his warder it occurred to billy that since jimmy phillips was not to be seen he might as well carry his own friendly message so he said guardedly bug up old man keep a stiff upper lip and be careful what you say this is only your preliminary trial remember lots of things may happen before court sets the devil looks after his own you know jeff had a good ear for voices however and billy's moustache still kept more than a hint of mephistopheles jeff slowly surveyed billy's natty attire with a lingering and insulting interest for such evidences of prosperity as silken hosiery and a rather fervid scarf-pin at last his eye met billy's and billy was blushing does he drawled jeff languidly ah you own the car then poor billy notwithstanding the ingratitude of this rebuff billy sought out jimmy phillips and recounted to him the circumstances of the arrest oh naughty naughty said the deputy caressing his nose lake's been a cowman on rainbow he knew the brand on that horse he knew jeff was chummy with monte he knew in all reason that jeff was in there and most likely he knew it all the time so he sneaks off to see lars after shooting him from ambush damn him and sends you to take jeff looks like he might be willing for you and jeff to damage either which or both of yourselves as the case may be it looks so said billy must be a fine girl murmured jimmy absently well what are you going to do looks pretty plain it looks plain to us but we haven't got a single tangible thing against lake yet we'd be laughed out of court if we brought an accusation against him we'll have to wait and keep our eyes open you're sure lake did it there was no rubber nose piece at monty's house all the rest of the football outfit but not that that looks bad for jeff on the contrary that is the strongest link against lake i dare say badensky uh, mr ransford is eminently capable of bank robbery at odd moments but i know approximately where that nose guard was at sharp midnight after the watchman was shot here billy swore mentally having a very definite guess as to how jeff might have lost the nose guard lake clark turnbull thompson ellick or myself one of the six of us brought that nose guard to the bank after the robbery and only one of the six had a motive and a key only one of you had a key corrected jimmy cruelly but can't jeff prove where he was maybe he won't i'd sure like to see her said jimmy End of chapter nine chapter ten of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the alibi and all love's clanging trumpets shocked and blew the executioner's argument was that you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body to cut it off from that he had never had to do such a thing before and he wasn't going to begin at his time of life alice in wonderland the justice of the peace when the county court was not in session held hearings in the courtroom proper which occupied the entire second story of the county courthouse the room was crowded it was a new courthouse there are people impatient to try even a new hearse and this bad fare to be arcadia's first cause celebre jeff sat in the prisoner's stall a target for boring eyes 
he was conscious of an undesirable situation exactly how tight a place it was he had no means of knowing until he should have heard the evidence the room was plainly hostile black looks were cast upon him deputy phillips as he entered arm in arm with the sometime devil gave the prisoner an intent but non-committal look which jeff rightly interpreted as assurance of a friend in ambush he felt unaccountably sure of the devil's fraternal aid monte lolling behind the rail of the witness-box smiled across at him still he would have felt better for another friendly face or two he thought save john wesley pringles jeff looked from the open window cottonwoods well watered gave swiftest growth of any trees and are therefore the dominant feature of new communities in dry lands the courthouse yard was crowded with them jeff from the window could see nothing but their green plumes and his thoughts ran naturally upon gardens or to be more accurate upon a garden would she lose faith in him had she heard yet would he be able to clear himself no mere acquittal would do because of eleanor there must be no question no verdict of not proven she would go east to-morrow perhaps she would not hear of his arrest at all he hoped not the bank robbery the murder yes she would hear of them perhaps but why need she hear his name hers was a world so different he fell into a muse at this deputy phillips passed and stood close to him looking down from the window his back was to jeff but under cover of the confused hum of many voices he spake low from the corner of his mouth play your hand close to your bosom old-timer wait for the draw and watch the dealer he strolled over to the other side of the judicial bench whence he came this vulgar speech betrayed jimmy as one given to evil courses but to jeff that muttered warning was welcome as thunder of blucher squadrons to british squares at waterloo down the aisle came a procession consciously important the prosecuting attorney the bank's lawyer who was to assist for the people and lake himself as they passed the gate jeff smiled his sweetest hello wally lake's name was stephen walter wally made no verbal response but his undershot jaw did the steel trap act and there was a triumphant glitter in his eye he turned his broad back pointedly and jeff smiled again the justice took his seat on the raised dais intervening between jeff and the sheriff's desk court was opened the usual tedious preliminaries followed jeff waived a jury trial refused a lawyer and announced that he would call no witnesses at present in an impressive stillness the prosecutor rose for his opening statement condensed it recounted the history of the crime so far as known fixed the time by the watchman's statement to be confirmed he said by another witness the telephone girl on duty at that hour who had heard the explosion and the ensuing gunshot touched upon that watchman's faithful service and his present desperate condition he told of the late finding of the injured man the meeting in the bank the sum taken by the robber and the discovery in the bank of the rubber nose-piece which he submitted as exhibit a he cited the witnesses by whom he would prove each statement and laid special stress upon the fact that the witness clark would testify that the nose-piece had been found upon the shattered fragments of the safe door conclusive proof that it had been dropped after the crime and he then held forth at some length upon the hand of providence as manifested in the unconscious self-betrayal which had frustrated and brought to naught the prisoner's fiendish designs on the whole he spoke well of providence now jeff had not once thought of the discarded nose-guard since he first found it in his way he began to see how tightly the net was drawn around him there was a serpent in the garden he reflected a word from miss hoffman would set him free if she gave that word at once it would be unpleasant for her but if she gave it later as a last resort it would be more than unpleasant and in that same hurried moment jeff knew that he would not call upon her for that word all his crowded life he had kept the happy knack of falling on his feet the stars that fought in their courses against sisera 
had ever fought for reckless bransford he decided with lovable folly to trust to chance to his wits and to his friends and now your honour we come to the unbreakable chain of evidence which fatally links the prisoner at the bar to this crime we will prove that the prisoner was not invited to the masquerade ball given last night by mr lake we will prove uh, there was a stir in the courtroom the prosecutor paused disconcerted eyes were turned to the double door at the back of the courtroom in the entry at the head of the stairs huddled a group of shrinking girls before them one foot upon the threshold stood eleanor hoffman she shook off a detaining hand and stepped into the room head erect proud pale across the sea of curious faces her eyes met the prisoners of all the courtroom billy and deputy phillips alone turned then to watch jeff's face they saw an almost imperceptible shake of his head a finger on lip a reassuring gesture saw too the quick pulse beat at his throat the colour flooded back to eleanor's face men nearest the door were swift to bring chairs the prosecutor resumed his interrupted speech his voice was deep hard vibrant your honour the counts against this man are fairly damning we will prove that he was shaved in a barber shop in arcadia at ten o'clock last night that he then rode a roan horse that the horse was then sweating profusely that this horse was afterward found at the house of oh but we will take that up later we will prove by many witnesses that among the masqueraders was a man wearing a football suit wearing a nose-piece similar entirely similar to the one found in the bank which now lies before you we will prove that this football player was not seen in the ballroom after the hour of eleven p m we will prove that when he was next seen without the ballroom it was not until sufficient time had elapsed for him to have committed this awful crime eleanor half rose from her seat again jeff flashed a warning at her we will prove this your honour by a most unwilling witness rosalio marquez monte smiled across at jeff a friend of the prisoner who in his behalf has not scrupled to defy the majesty of the law we can prove by this witness this reluctant witness that when he returned to his home shortly after midnight he found there the prisoner's horse which had not been there when mr marquez left the house some four hours previously and that at some time subsequent to twelve o'clock the witness marquez was awakened by the entrance of the prisoner at the bar clad in a football suit but wearing no nosepiece with it and we have the evidence of the sheriff's posse that they found in the home of the witness rosalio marquez the football suit which we offer as exhibit b nay more the prisoner did not deny and indeed admitted that this uniform was his but mark this the searching party found no nosepiece there it is true your honour that the stolen money was not found upon the prisoner it is true that the prisoner made no use of the opportunity to escape offered him by his lawless and disreputable friend rosalio marquez a common gambler doubtless your honour his cunning had devised some diabolical plan upon which he relied to absolve himself from suspicion and now trembling he has for the first time learned of the fatal flaw in his concocted defence which he had so fondly deemed invincible all eyes including the orators here turned upon the prisoner to find him so far from trembling quite otherwise engaged the prisoner's elbow was upon the rail his chin in his hand he regarded mr lake attentively with cheerful amusement and a quizzical smile which in some way subtly carried an expression of mockery and malicious triumph to this fixed and disconcerting regard mr lake opposed an iron front but the effort required was apparent to all there was an uneasy rustling through the court the prisoner's bearing was convincing natural this was no mere brazen assuming the banker's forced composure was not natural he should have been an angry banker of the two men lake was the less at ease the prisoner's face turned at last towards the door 
blank unrecognition was in his eyes as they swept past eleanor but he shook his head once more very slightly there was a sense of mystery in the air a buzz and burr of whispers a rustle of moving feet the audience noticeably relaxed its implacable attitude toward the accused eyed him with a different interest seemed to feel for the first time that after all he was accused merely and that his defence had not yet been heard the prosecutor felt this subtle change it lamed his periods it is true your honour that uh, no eye save god saw this guilty man do this deed but the web of circumstantial evidence is so closely drawn so far-reaching so unanswerable so damning that no defence can avail him except the improbable the impossible establishment of an alibi so complete so convincing as to satisfy even his bitterest enemy we will ask you your honour when you have seen how fully the evidence bears out our every contention to commit the prisoner without bail to answer the charge of robbery and attempted murder then by the door jeff saw the girl start up she swept down the aisle radiant brave unfearing resolute all half gods gone she shone at him proud glowing triumphant a hush fell upon the thrilled room jeff was on his feet his hand held out to stay her his eyes spoke to hers she stopped as at a command scarcely slower billy was at her side wait wait he whispered see what he has to say there will be always time for that jeff's eyes held hers she sank into an offered chair cheated disappointed the court took breath again their dramatic moment had been nothing but their own nerves their own excited imaginations had attached a pulse-fluttering significance to the flushed cheeks of a prying girl seeking a better place to see and hear to gratify her morbid curiosity jeff turned to the bench your honour i have a perfectly good line of defence and i trust no friend of mine will undertake to change it i will keep you but a minute he said colloquially i will not waste your time combating the ingenious theory which the prosecution has built up or in cross-examination of their witnesses who i feel sure here he bowed to the cloud of witnesses will testify only to the truth i quite agree with my learned friend another graceful bow that the case he has so ably presented is so strong that it can successfully be rebutted only by an alibi so clear and so incontestable as my learned friend has so aptly phrased it as to convince if not satisfy my bitterest enemy the bow the subtle icy intonation edged the words the courtroom thrilled again at the unspoken thought an enemy hath done this thing if in the stillness the prisoner had quoted the words aloud in fierce denunciation the effect could not have been different or more startling and that your honour is precisely what i propose to do his honour was puzzled he was a good judge of men and the prisoner's face was not a bad face but he objected you have refused to call any witnesses for the defence your unsupported word will count for nothing you cannot prove an alibi alone can't i said jeff watch me with a single motion he was through the open window bending branches of the nearest cottonwood broke his fall the other trees hid his flight behind him rose uproar tumult and hullabaloo a mass of struggling men at cross purposes gun in hand the sheriff stumbling over someone's foot montes ran to the window but the faithful deputy was before him blocking the way firing with loving care at one particular tree trunk he was a good shot jimmy he afterward showed with pride where each ball had struck in a scant six inch space vainly the sheriff tried to force his way through there was but one stairway and it was jammed before the foremost pursuer had reached the open jeff had borrowed one of the saddled horses hitched at the rack and was away to the hills as billy struggled through the press searching for eleanor he found himself at jimmy's elbow a dead game sport 
any turn in the road agreed billy the deputy nodded curtly but his answer was inconsequent rather in the brunette line that bit of tangible evidence end of chapter ten chapter eleven of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven the nettle danger bushel o wheat bushel o rye all ain't ready holler i hide and seek double mountain lies lost in the desert dwarfed by the greatness all about its form is that of a crater split from north to south into irregular halves through that narrow cleft ran a straight road once the well-travelled thoroughfare from rainbow to el paso for there was precious water within those upheaved walls it was but three miles from portal to portal the slight climb to the divide had not been grudged time was when campfires were nightly merry to light the narrow cliffs of double mountain when songs were gay to echo from them when this had been the only watering place to break the long span across the desert the railroad had changed all this and the silent leagues of that old road lay untrodden in the sun not untrodden on this day after jeff had established his alibi a traveller followed that lonely road to double mountain and behind halfway to rainbow range was a streak of dust which gained on him the traveller's sorrel horse was weary for it was the very horse jeff bransford had borrowed from the itching rail of the courthouse square the traveller was that able negotiator himself and the pursuing dust to the best of jeff's knowledge and belief meant him no good tidings now i got safe away from the foothills before day soliloquized jeff some gentleman has overtaken me with a spyglass i reckon civilization's getting this country plumb ruined and their horses are fresh peg along alibi maybe i can pick up a stray horse at double mountain if i can't there's no sort of use trying to get away on you i'll play hide and seek em that'll let you out anyway so cheer up you done fine old man if i ever get out of this i'll buy you and make it all right with you pension you off if you think you'll like it get along now twenty miles to jeff's right the railroad paralleled the wagon road in an unbroken tangent of ninety miles stretch a southbound passenger train crawled along the west like a resolute centipede plodding to a date behind the fugitive abreast now far behind creeping along the shining straightaway forty miles the hour was her schedule yet against this vast horizon she could hardly be said to change place until sighting beyond her puny length a new angle of the far western wall completed the trinomial line escondido was hidden in a dip of plain whence the name hidden when done into saxon speech the train was lost to sight when she stopped there but jeff saw the tiny steam plume of her whistling rise in the clear and taintless air long after the faint sound of it hummed drowsily by like passing far-blown horns of fairy in a dream and at no great interval thereafter a low-lying dust appeared suddenly on the hither rim of escondido's sunken valley jeff knew the land as you know your hallway that line of dust marked the trail from escondido valley to the farther gate of double mountain even if he should be lucky enough to get a change of mounts at the spring in double mountain basin he would be intercepted escape by flight was impossible to fight his way out was impossible he had no gun and even if he had a gun he could not see his way to fight under the circumstances the men who hunted him down were only doing the right thing as they saw it had jeff been guilty it would have been a different affair being innocent he could make no fight for it he was cornered said the little eopas i'm going to be a horse so chanted jeff perceiving the hopelessness of his plight the best gift to man or if not the best then at least the rarest is the power to meet the emergency to do your best and a little better than your best when nothing less will serve to be a pinch hitter 
it is to be thought that certain stages of affection and more particularly the presence of its object affect unfavourably the workings of pure intellect certain it is that capable bransford who had cut so sorry a figure in eden garden now in these distressing but eveless circumstances rose to the occasion collected resourceful he grasped every possible angle of the situation and with the rope virtually about his neck cheerfully planned the impossible the essence of his elastic plan being to climb that very rope hand over hand to safety going round the mountain is no good on a give-out horse they'll follow my tracks said jeff to jeff men who are much alone so shape their thoughts by voicing them just as you practice conversation rather to make your own thought clear to yourself than to enlighten your victim uh, beg pardon your neighbor just a slip of the tongue vecino is the spanish for neighbor you know not so much to enlighten your neighbor as to find out for yourself precisely what it is you think hiding in the basin is no good can't get out would i were a bird only one way got to go straight up disappear vanish in the air up a chimney up ah that's backward up a chimney down or oh, down a chimney down but not up a chimney up nor down a chimney up so that's settled now let me see says the little man mighty few arcadians know me well enough not to be fooled maybe so blake blake won't come he'll be busy there's jimmy but jimmy's got a shocking bad memory for faces sometimes just now my face i think maybe i could manage jimmy the sheriff that would be real awkward i reckon i'll just play the sheriff isn't in the bunch and build my little bluff according to that pleasing fancy for if he comes along it is all off with little jeff now let me see if gwen's workin that little old mine of his why he'll lie himself black in the face just for the principle of it mighty interesting talker gwen is and if no one's there i'll be there not jeff bransford he got away i'll be um long toby long working for gwen toby long i apprenticed my son to a miner and the first thing he took was a new name far away on the side of double mountain he could even now see the white triangle of the tent at gwen's mine the ophir and the great dump spilling down the hillside there was no smoke to be seen jeff made up his mind there was no one at the mine which was what he devoutly hoped and further developed his gleeful hypothesis let's see now toby got to study this out they most always leave all their kegs full of water when they go away so they won't have to pack em up the first thing when they come back if they did i'm all right if they didn't i'm in a hell of a fix they'll leave em full though of course they did unless the kegs would all dry up and fall down he glanced over his shoulder them fellows are ten or twelve miles back i reckon they'll slow up soon as they see i'm headed off i'll have time to fix things up if only there's water in the kegs at the mine he patted alibi's head now old man do your damnedest it's pretty tough on you but your part will soon be over alibi had made a poor night of it what with doubling and twisting in the foothills the bitter water of a jip spring and the scanty grass of a cedar thicket but he did his plucky best on the legal other hand as jeff had prophesied the dust makers behind had slackened their gait when they perceived by the dust of escondido trail that their allies must cut the quarry off so alibi held his own with the pursuit he came to the rising ground leading to the sheer base of double mountain then to the narrow gap where the mountain had fallen asunder in some age-old cataclysm to the left the dump of ophir mine hung on the hillside above the pass and on the broad trail zigzagging up to it were burrow tracks but no fresh tracks of men the flaps of the white tent on the dump were tightly closed there was no one at the mine jeff passed within the walls through frowning gates of porphyry and gneiss and urged alibi up the canyon it was half a mile to the spring on the way he found three shaggy burros grazing beside the road 
he drove them into the small pen by the spring and tossed his rope on the largest one then he unsaddled alibi tied him to the fence by the bridle rein and searched his pockets for an old letter this found he penciled a note and tied it to the saddle it was brief en route four p m please water my horse when he cools off your little friend jeff bransford p s excuse haste he made a plain trail of high-heeled boot tracks to the spring where he drank deep thence beyond through the sandy soil to the nearest rocky ridge then careful that every step fell on a bare rock he came circuitously back to the corral climbed the fence made his way to the tied burrow improvised a bridle of cunning half hitches slipped from the fence to the burrow's back a burrow by the way is a donkey named the burrow anew as balaam and went back down the canyon at the best pace of which the belabored and astonished balaam was capable as jeff had hoped the two other burrows or the other two burrows to be precise followed sociably braying remonstrance without the mouth of the canyon jeff rode up the steep trail to the mine also to the great disgust of his mount but he must not walk it would leave boot tracks for the same reason after freeing balaam his first action was to pull off the tell-tale boots and replace them with the smallest pair of hobnailed miner's shoes in the tent with these he carefully obliterated the few boot tracks at the tent door the water kegs were full jeff swore his joyful gratitude and turned his eye to the plain the pursuing dust was still far away seven miles he estimated or possibly eight the three burrows nibbled on the bushes below the dump plainly intending to stay round camp with an eye for possible tips jeff gave his whole-hearted attention to the mise en scene never did stage manager toil so hard so faithfully so effectively as this one or with so great a need he took stock of the available stage properties beginning with a careful inventory of the grub chest to betray ignorance of its possibilities or deficiencies would be fatal following a narrow trail round a little shoulder of hill he found the powder magazine taking three sticks of dynamite with fuse and caps he searched the tent for the candle box lit a candle and went into the tunnel with a brisk trot if this was a case of fight now i'd have some pretty fair weapon here for close quarters said jeff but the way i'm fixed i can't no fighting goes unless lake comes in the tunnel his luck held good he found a number of good-sized chunks of rock stacked along the wall near the breast evidently reserved for the ore pile at a more convenient season beneath three of the largest of these rocks he carefully adjusted the three sticks of giant powder properly capped and fused lit the fuses and retreated to the safety of the dump three muffled detonations followed at short intervals having thus announced the presence of mining operations he built a fire on the kitchen side of the dump to further advertise a mind conscious of its own rectitude the pleasant shadow of the hills was cool about him the flame rose clear and bright in the windless air to be seen from far away he looked at the location papers in the monument by the ore stack simultaneously by way of economizing time emptying a can of salmon this was partly for the added verisimilitude of the empty tin partly because he was ravenously hungry you may guess how he emptied the tin the mine had changed owners since jeff's knowledge of it it was no longer gwyn's sole property the notice bore the signatures of j gwyn c w sanders and walter fleck jeff grinned and his eye brightened he knew fleck only slightly but fleck's reputation among the cowmen was good that is to say as you would see it very bad pappy sanders postmaster and storekeeper of escondido was an old and sorely tried friend of jeff's if pappy had grub staked the outfit a faraway plan began to shape vaguely in his fertile brain he took the little turquoise horse from his pocket and laid it in the till of the violated trunk were you told about the violated trunk uh, never mind he had done any amount of other things of which you have not been told 
for it was his task in the brief time allotted to him to master all the innumerable details needful for an intelligent reading of his part he must make no blunders he toiled like two men each swifter and more savagely efficient than himself he upset the prim old he maidenish order of that carefully packed spick and span camp he rumpled the beds strewed old clothes books candles specimens pipes and cigarette papers with lavish hand made untidy sprawling heaps of tin plates knives forks and spoons spilled candle grease and tobacco on the scoured table and generally gave things a cosy and habitable appearance he gave a hundred deft touches here and there he spread an open book face downward on the table it was alice in wonderland and he opened it at the mock turtle meanwhile an unoccupied eye snatched titles from a shelf of books against possible question he penned a short note to himself mr toby long in gwyn's handwriting folded the note to creases twisted it to a spill lit it burned a corner of it pinched it out and threw it under the table and while doing these and other things he somehow managed to shed every article of jeff bransford's clothing and to put on the work-stained garments of a miner the perspiration on his face was no stage make-up but good honest sweat he rubbed stone dust and sand on his sweaty arms and into his sweaty hair he rubbed most of it from his hair and into the two-day stubble on his face simultaneously fishing razor and mug from the trunk leaving them in evidence on the table he worked stone dust into his ears behind his ears he grimed it on forehead and neck he even dropped a little into his shoes which all this while had been performing independent miracles to make the camp look comfortable he threw on a dingy cap thrust in the cap a miner's candlestick with a lighted candle that it might properly drip upon him while he arranged further details and so faced the world as toby long a stooped and overworked man mr toby long working with feverish haste dug a small cave halfway down the steep side of the dump farthest from the road and buried therein a tightly rolled bundle containing every article appertaining to the defunct bransford with the single exception of the little eopus a pocket-knife which a miner must have to cut powder and fuse having been found in the trunk what time also the little turquoise horse was transferred to mr long's pocket to bring him luck in his new career a poor thing compared with the cowman's keen blade but better for mr long's purpose as smelling strongly of dynamite then mr long toby hid the grave by sliding and shoveling broken rock down the dump upon it next he threw into a wheelbarrow drills spoon tamping stick gads drill hammer rock hammer canteen shovel and pick taking care even in his haste to select a properly matched set of drills and trundled the barrow up the drift at a pace which would give a miner's union the rabies at the breast he unshipped his cargo in right miner's fashion the drills in a graduated stepladder row along the wall loaded the barrow with broken ore a bit of charred fuse showing at the top and wheeled it out at the same unprofessional gait leaving it on the dump just above the spot where his late sepulchral rites had freshened the appearance of the sun-beaten dump he next performed his ablutions in an amateurish and perfunctory fashion scrupulously observing a well-defined water-line there said mr long i near made a break that time he went back to the barrow and trundled it assiduously to the tunnel's mouth and back several times carefully never in quite the same place finally leaving it not above the sepulchred spoil but near the ore stack as befitted its valuable contents i gotta think of everything one long break'll fix me good said mr long he felt his neck delicately as if he detected some foreign presence there in the tunnel now there's only the one place where the wheel can go so it don't matter so much in there the fire having now burned down to proper coals mr long set about supper 
with the corner of his eye on the lookout for the pursuers of the late bransford he set the coffee-pot by the fire they were now in the edge of the tar-brush there were only two of them he put on a pot of potatoes in their jackets he could see them plainly diminutive black horsemen twinkling through the brush he sliced bacon into a frying-pan and put it aside to await his cue he disposed other cooking ware in lifelike attitudes near the fire they were in the long shadow of double mountain their horses were jaded they rode slowly he dropped the sourdough jar and placed the broken pieces where they would be inconspicuously visible having thus a perfectly obvious excuse for not having sourdough bread which requires thirty-six hours of running start for preliminary rising jeff uh, mr toby long mixed up a just as good baking powder substitute they rode like young men they rode like young men not to the saddle born and toby permitted himself a chuckle by hooky i've got an even chance for my little bluff he shook his head reprovingly at himself for this last admission with every minute he looked more like toby long than ever if only there had been any toby long to look like his mind ran upon nuggets pockets placers faults true fissure veins the cyanide process concentrates chlorides sulphides assays leases and bonds his face took on the strained wistfulness which marks the confirmed prospector he was toby long the bell rang end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the siege of double mountain Timeo de naos et donne ferentes the dictionary hoo-ee hello as the curtain rose to the flying echoes long stepped to the edge of the dump frying-pan in hand and sent back an answering shout in the startled high notes of a lonely man taken unawares hello he brandished his hospitable pan then he put it down cupped his hands to mouth and trumpeted a hearty welcome chuck come up supper's ready can't see any one go by about two hours ago eh louder see a man on a sorrel horse no i've been in the tunnel come up can't we're after an outlaw what after a murderer wait a minute i'll go down too hard to yell so far mr long started precipitately down the zigzag but the riders had got all the information of interest that mr long could furnish and they were eager to be in at the death can't wait he's inside the mountain somewheres some of the boys are waiting for him at the other end they rode on mr long posed for a statue of disappointment hung on the steep trail rather as if he might conclude to coil himself into a ball and roll down the hill to overtake them stop as you come back he bellowed i want to hear about it did jeff uh, mr long did mr long now attempt to escape not so gifted with prevision beyond most mr long's mind misgave him that these young men would be baffled in their pleasing expectations they would be back before sundown very cross and a miner's brogan leaves a track not to be missed that mr long was unfeignedly fatigued from the varied efforts of the day need not be mentioned for that alone would have stayed his flight but the nearest water save escondido was thirty-five miles and at escondido he would be watched for not to say that when he was missed some of the searching party would straightway go to escondido to frustrate him present escape was not to be thought of instead mr long made a hearty meal from the simple viands that had been in course of preparation when he was surprised eked out by canned corn fried in bacon grease to a crisp golden brown then after a cigarette he betook himself to sharpening tools with laudable industry the tools were already sharp but that did not stop mr long he built a fire in the forge set up a step-ladder of matched drills in the blackened water of the tempering tub 
he thrust a gad and one short drill into the fire when the gad was at a good cherry heat he thrust it hissing into the tub to bring the water to a convincing temperature and when he reheated he did it again from time to time he held the one drill to the anvil and shaped it drawing it alternately to a chisel bit or a bull bit mr long could sharpen a drill with any having been in very truth a miner of sorts he could toy thus with one drill without giving it any very careful attention and his thoughts were now busy on how best to be mr long accordingly from time to time he added an artistic touch to mr long grime under his fingernails a smudge of smut on an eyebrow his hands displeased him after some experimenting to get the proper heat of it he grasped the partially cooled gad with the drill pincers and held it very lightly to a favoured few of those portions of the hand known to chiromaniacs as the mounts of jupiter saturn and other extinct immortals satisfactory blisters while you wait were thus obtained these were pricked with a pin some were torn to tatters with dust and coal rubbed in to give them a venerable appearance the pain was no light matter but mr long had a real affection for mr bransford's neck and it is trifles like these that make perfection the next expedient was even more heroic mr long assiduously put stone dust in one eye leaving it tearful bloodshot and violently inflamed and the other one was sympathetically red did i steal in my eye explained mr long unselfish devotion such as this is all too rare all this time at proper intervals mr long sharpened and resharpened that one long-suffering drill he tripped into the tunnel and smote a mighty blow upon the country rock with a pick therefore qualifying that pick for repointing and laid it on the forge as next on the list what further outrage she meditated is not known for he now heard a horse coming up the trail he was beating out a merry tattoo when a white-hatted head rose through a trap-door rose above the level of the dump rather hammer in hand long straightened up joyfully as best he could but could not straighten up the tell-tale droop of his shoulders it was not altogether assumed either this hump jeff a uh, mr long had not done so much work of this sort for years and there was a very real pain between his shoulder blades still but for the exigencies of art he might have borne his neck less turtle wise than he did hello got him where's your partner watching the gap the young man rather breathless from the climb answered the last question first as he led his horse on the dump no we didn't get him but he can't get away hiding somewhere in the basin afoot found his horse pretty well done up the insolence of the outlaw's letter smote him afresh he reddened no tracks going out of the basin two of our friends guarding the other end they say he can't get out over the cliffs anywhere that's so the speech came jerkily he was still short of breath from his scramble not without a flying machine said long no way out that i know of except where the wagon road goes what's he done robbery murder we'll see that he don't get out by the wagon road asserted the youth confidently watch the gaps and starve him out oh speaking of starving said toby go into the tent and i'll bring you some supper while you tell me about it baked up another batch of bread on the chance you come back why thank you very much mr uh, long toby long mr long my name is gurdon steele glad to meet you why if you will be so kind that is what i came up to see you about if you can let us have what we need of course we will pay you for it of course you won't it had not needed the offer to place mr gurdon steele quite accurately he was a handsome lad fresh complexioned dressed in the western manner as practised on the boardwalk you're welcome to what i got sure but i ain't got much variety gwen the old liar said he was comin out the twentieth sure enough he didn't so the grub's runnin low table in the tent come on 
oh no i couldn't you know rex that's my partner is quite as hungry as i am you see but if you could give me something anything you have to take down there i really couldn't you know the admirable doctrine of noblesse oblige in its delicate application by this politeness was easier for its practitioner than to put it into words suited to the comprehension of his hearers he concluded lamely i'll take it down there and we will eat it together see here said toby i'm as hungry to hear about your outlaw as you are to eat i'll just throw my bedding and a lot of chuck on your saddle we'll carry the coffee pot and frying pan in our hands and the sugar can and things like that you can tank up and give me the news in small chunks at the same time afterward two of us can sleep while one stands guard this was done it was growing dark when they reached the bottom of the hill the third guardsman had built a fire rex this is mr long who has been kind enough to grubstake us and share our watch with us mr steele you have observed had accepted mr long without question but his first impression of mr long had been gained under circumstances highly favourable to the designs of the latter gentleman mr steele had come upon him unexpectedly finding him as it were in medias res with all his skilfully arranged scenery to aid the illusion the case was now otherwise the thousand-tongued vouching of his background lacked to him mr long had not save his own unthinkable audacity to belie his face withal from the first instant mr rex griffith was the prey of suspicion acute bigoted churlish deep dark distrustful damnable and so on down to zealous he had a sharp eye he wore no puttees and mr long had a vaguely uncomfortable memory holding over from some previous incarnation of having seen that long shrewd face in a courtroom the host on hospitable rites intent likewise all ears and eager questionings was all unconscious of hostile surveillance nothing could be more carefree more at ease than his bearing his pleasant anticipatory excitement was the natural outlook for a lonely and newsless man as the heart panteth for the water so he thirsted for the story but his impatient hasty questions following false sense delayed the telling of the arcadian tale so innocent was he so open and above board that griffith watching alert felt thoroughly ashamed of himself yet he watched doubting still though his reason rebelled at the monstrous imaginings of his heart that the outlaw unarmed and unasked should venture pshaw such effrontery was inconceivable he allowed steele to tell the story himself contributing only an occasional crafty question designed to enable his host to betray himself bransford interrupted mr long not jeff bransford up south rainbow way that's the man said steele i don't believe it said long flatly he was sipping coffee with his guests he put his cup down i know him a little he don't oh there's no doubt of it interrupted steele in his turn he detailed the circumstances with skilful care besides why did he run away gee you ought to have seen that escape it was splendid well now who'd a thought that demanded long still only half convinced he didn't strike me like that kind of a man well you never can tell how come you fellows to be chasing him you see said steele every one was sure he'd gone up to rainbow the sheriff and posse is up there now looking for him but we four stone and harlow the chaps at the other end were with us you know we were up at the foothills on a deer hunt we were out early sun-up is the best time for deer they tell me and we had a spy-glass well we just happened to see a man ride out from between two hills quite a way off stone noticed right away that he was riding a sorrel horse it was a sorrel horse that bransford stole you know we didn't suspect though who it was till a bit later then rex tried to pick him up again and saw that he was going out of his way to avoid the ridges keeping cover you know then we caught on and took after him pell-mell had a big start but he was riding slowly so as not to make a dust 
that is till he saw our dust and then he lit out you're not deputies then said long oh no not at all said steele secretly flattered so harlow and stone galloped off to town the program was that they'd wired down to escondido to have horses ready for them come down on number six and head him off they were not to tell anyone in arcadia there's five thousand dollars reward out for him but it isn't that exactly it was a cowardly beastly murder don't you know and we thought it would be rather a big thing if we could take him alone you got him penned all right said toby he can't get out so far as i know unless he runs over us or the men at the other end by george we must get away from this fire too he set the example dragging the bedding with him to the shelter of a big rock he could pick us off too slick here in the light how are you gonna get him there's a heap of country in that basin all rough and broken full of boulders mighty good cover starve him out said griffith this was base deceit deep in his heart he believed that the quarry sat beside him well fed and contented yet the unthinkable insolence of it if this were indeed bransford dulled his belief long laughed as he spread down the bed he'll shoot a deer maybe if he had it all planned out he may have grub cashed in there somewhere there's water tanks in the rocks they what are your partners at the other side going to do for grub oh they brought out cheese and crackers and stuff said gird i'll tell you what boys you've bit off more'n you can chaw said jeff uh, toby that is he can't get out without a fight but then you can't go in there to hunt for him without weakening your guard and he'd be under shelter and have all the best of it he'd shoot you so dead you'd never know what happened i don't want none of it i'd as lief put on boxing gloves and crawl into a hole after a bear look here now this is your show but i'm a heap older than you boys want to know what i think certainly said rex going to talk turkey to me an avaricious light came into long's eyes of course you're in on the reward said rex diffidently and rather stiffly we're not in this for the money i can use the money whatever share you want to give me said long dryly but if you take my advice my shares won't be but a little i think you ought to keep under shelter at the mouth of this canyon one of you and let the other one go to escondido and send for help quick and a lot of it what's the matter with you going asked griffith disingenuously he wanted long to show his hand it would never do to abandon the siege of double mountain to arrest this soi disant long on mere suspicion on the other hand mr rex griffith had no idea of letting long escape his clutches until his identity was established one way or the other beyond all question that was why long declined the offer his honest gaze shifted i ain't much of a rider he said evasively young griffith read correctly the thought which the excuse concealed evidently long considered himself an elder soldier if not a better than either of his two young guests but wished to spare their feelings by not letting them find it out griffith found this plain solution inconsistent with his homicidal theory a murderer fleeing for his life would have jumped at the chance there are two sides to every question let us this once prove both sides wholly oblivious to griffith's lynx-eyed watchfulness and his leading questions mr long yet recognized the futility of an attempt to ride away on mr griffith's horse with mr griffith's venison there we have the other point of view we'll have to send for grub anyway pursued the sagacious mr long i've only got a little left and that old liar gwen won't be out for four days if he comes then and er uh, look now if i was you boys i'd let the sheriff and his posse smoke your badger out they get paid to tend to that that looks to me like someone was going to get hurt you've done enough all this advice was so palpably sound that the doubter was for the second staggered for a second only this was the man he had seen in the prisoner stock he was morally sure of it for all the difference of appearance this was the man 
yet those blasts the far-seen fire the hearty welcome this delivery of himself into their hands griffith scarcely knew what he did think he blamed himself for his unworthy suspicions he blamed gertie more for having no suspicions at all anything else he said that sounds good toby studied for some time well he said at last there may be some way he can get out i don't think he can but he might find a way he knows he's trapped but likely he has no idea yet how many of us there are so we know he'll try and he won't be just climbing for fun he'll take a chance steele broke in he didn't leave any rope on his saddle toby nodded so he means to try it now here's five of us here seems to me that someone ought to ride round the mountain the first thing in the morning and every day afterward only here's hopin there won't be many of em to look for tracks there isn't one chance in a hundred he can climb out but if he goes out of here afoot we've got him sure the man on guard wants to keep in shelter it's light to-night there's no chance for him to slip out without being seen you say the old watchman ain't dead yet mr griffith no the latest bulletin was that he was almost holding his own hope he gets well said long good old geezer now cap i've worked hard and you've ridden hard better set your guards and let the other two take a little snooze griffith was not proof against the insidious flattery of this unhesitant preference he flushed with embarrassment and pleasure well if i'm to be captain gerd will take the first guard till eleven then you come in till two mr long i'll stand from then on till daylight in five minutes mr long was enjoying the calm and restful sleep of fatigued innocence but his poor captain was doomed to have a bad night of it with two bransfords on his hands one in the basin and one in the bed beside him his head was dizzy with the vicious circle like the gentlewoman of the nursery rhyme he was tempted to cry rock a mercy on me this is none of i if he hailed his bedmate to justice and the real bransford got away that would be a nice predicament for an ambitious young man he was sensitive to ridicule and he saw here such an opportunity to earn it as knocks but once at any man's door if on the other hand while he held bransford cooped tightly in the basin this thrice accursed long should escape him and there should be no bransford in the basin what nonsense what utter twaddle bransford was in the basin he had found his horse and saddle his tracks no tracks had come out of the basin immediately on the discovery of the outlaw's horse gerd had ridden back post haste and held the pass while he the captain had gone on to the mouth of the southern canyon and posted his friends he had watched for tracks of a footman every step of the way going and coming there had been no tracks bransford was in the basin he watched the face of the sleeping man but by heaven this was bransford was ever a poor captain in such a predicament a moment before he had fully and definitely decided once for all that this man was not bransford could not be bransford that it was not possible his reason unwaveringly told him one thing his eyesight the other yet bransford or an unfortunate twin of his lay now beside him and for further mockery slept peacefully serene untroubled he looked upon the elusive mr long with a species of horror the face was drawn and lined yet but forty-eight hours of tension would have left bransford's face not otherwise he had noticed bransford's hands in the courtroom noticed their well-kept whiteness due as he had decided to the perennial cowboy glove this man's hands as he had seen by the campfire were blistered and calloused calluses were not made in the day he took another look at long oh thunder he crept from bed he whispered a word to sentry steel not to outline the distressing state of his own mind but merely to request steel not to shoot him as he was going up to the mine he climbed up the trail chewing the unpalatable thought that gurdon had seen nothing amiss yet gurd had been at the trial 
the captain began to wish he had never gone on that deer hunt he went into the tent struck a match lit a candle and examined everything closely there was no gun in the camp and no cartridges he found the spill of twisted paper under the table smothered his qualms and read it he noted the open book for future examination in english and now toby's labor had their late reward for rex missed nothing every effort brought fresh disappointment and every disappointment spurred him to fresh effort he went into the tunnel he scrutinized everything even to the drills in the tub the food supply tallied with long's account no detail escaped him and every detail confirmed the growing belief that he captain griffith was a doddering imbecile he returned to the outpost convinced at last nevertheless merely to quiet the ravings of his insubordinate instincts now in open revolt he restaked the horses nearer to camp and cautiously carried both saddles to the head of the bed concession merely encouraged the rebels to further and successful outrages the government was overthrown he drew sentry steel aside and imparted his doubts that faithful follower heaped scorn mockery laughter and abuse upon his shrinking superior recounted all the points from the first blasts of dynamite to the present moment which favoured the charitable belief above mentioned as newly entertained by captain griffith concerning himself this belief of captain griffith was amply endorsed by his subordinate in terms of point and versatility of course they look alike i noticed that the minute i saw him the same amount of legs and arms features all in the forepart of his head hair on top one body wonderful why you pitiful ass that bransford person was a mighty keen-looking man in any company this fellow's a yokel an old rusty cap and ball single shot muzzle loader the bransford was an automatic steel frame high velocity the better head he has the more apt he is to do the unexpected ah shut up you've got incipient paresis stuff your ears in your mouth and go to sleep the captain sought his couch convinced but holding his first opinion savagely minded to arrest mr long rather than let him have a gun to stand guard with he was spared the decision mr long declined gurdon's proffered gun saying that he would be right there and he was a poor shot anyway gurdon slept long took his place and captain rex from the bed watched the watcher never was there a more faithful sentinel than mr long without relaxing his vigilance even to smoke he strained every faculty lest the wily bransford should creep out through the shadows the captain saw him a stooped figure sitting motionless by his rock always alert peering this way and that turning his head to listen once toby saw something he crept noiselessly to the bed and shook his chief griffith came with his gun something was stirring in the bushes after a little it moved out of the shadows it was a prowling coyote the captain went back to bed once more convinced of long's fidelity but resolved to keep a relentless eye on him just the same and all unawares as he revolved the day's events in his mind the captain dropped off to troubled sleep mr long woke him at three there had been a temptation to ride away but the saddles were at the head of the bed the ground was stony he would be heard he might have made an attempt to get both guns from under the pillow but detection meant ruin for him since to shoot these boys or to hurt them was out of the question escape by violence would have been easy and assured jeff preferred to trust his wits he was enjoying himself very much when the captain got his relentless eyes open and realized what had chanced he saw that further doubt was unworthy half an hour later the unworthy captain stole noiselessly to long's bedside and saw to his utter rage and distraction that mr bransford was there again it was almost too much to bear he felt that he should always hate long even after bransford was safely hanged bransford's head had slipped from long's pillow 
hating himself griffiths subtly withdrew the miner's folded overalls and went through the pockets he found there a knife smelling of dynamite matches a turquoise carved to what was plainly meant to be the form of a bad-tempered horse and two small specimens of ore altogether the captain passed a wild and whirling night End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen the siege of double mountain continued if the bowl had been stronger my tale had been longer mother goose when the sun peeped over rainbow range captain griffith bent over toby long's bed his eyes were aching burned and sunken the lids twitched his face was haggard and drawn but he had arrived at an unalterable decision this thing could not and should not go on his brain reeled now another such night would entitle him to state protection he shook mr long roughly see here i believe you're bransford himself thus taken off his guard long threw back the bedding rose to one elbow still half asleep and reached for his shoes laughing and yawning alternately then as he woke up a little more he saw a better way to dress dropped the shoes and unfurled his pillow which by day he wore as overalls fumbling behind him where the pillow had lain he found a much soiled handkerchief and tenderly dabbed at his swollen eye bit of steel in my eye from a drill head he explained jiminy but it's sore plainly he took the accusation as a pleasantry calling for no answer i mean it i'm going to keep you under guard said captain griffith bitingly poor sleepy toby half way into his overalls stared up at mr griffith his mouth dropped open he was quite at a loss for words the captain glared back at him toby kicked the overalls off and cuddled back into bed bully he said then i won't have to get breakfast gurdon steele sat up in bed a happy man his eye gave mr long a discreetly confidential look as of one who restrains himself out of instinctive politeness from a sympathetic and meaningful tap of one's forehead a new thought struck mr long he reached over behind steele for the rifle at the bed's edge and thrust it into the latter's hands here boy scout watch me he whispered don't let me escape while i sleep a few lines i'm bransford gertie rubbed his eyes and giggled don't you mind rex that's the worst of this pipe habit you never can tell how they'll break out next yeah laugh you blind bat said rex bitterly i've got him all the same and i'm going to keep him while you go to escondido his rifle was tucked under his arm he patted the barrel significantly it slowly dawned upon mr long that captain griffith was not joking after all and an angry man was he he sat up in bed oh piffle oh fudge oh pickled moonshine if i'm bransford what the deuce am i doing here why you was both asleep i could have shot your silly heads off and you'd a never woke up you make me tired don't mind him long he'll feel better when he takes a nap said gerd joyfully he has poor spells like this and he misses his nurse we always make allowances for him mr long's indignation at last overcame his politeness and in his wrath he attacked friend and foe indiscriminately do you mean to tell me you two puling infants are out hunting down a man you never saw don't the men at the other side know him either by jinks you hike out of this after breakfast and send for some grown-up men i want part of that reward and i'm going to have it look here he turned blackly to gurdon are you sure that bransford or anyone else came in here at all yesterday or did you dream it or was it all a damn fool kid joke listen here i worked like a dog yesterday if you have me stand guard three hours tired as i was for nothing there's going to be more to it what kind of a sack and snipe trick is this anyway you just come one at a time and i'll lick the stuffin out of both of you i ain't feelin like any schoolboy pranks just now 
no no that part's all straight bransford's in there all right protested gurdon if you hadn't been working in the tunnel you'd have seen him when he went by here's the note he left and his horse and saddle are up at the spring we left the horse there because he was lame and about all in bransford can't get away on him rex is just excited that's all the matter with him hankering for glory i told him last night not to make a driveling idiot of himself here read this insolent note will you long glowered at the note and flung it aside anybody could have wrote that how am i to know this thing ain't some more of your funny streaks you take these horses to water and bring back bransford's horse and saddle and then i'll know what to believe be damn sure you bring them to or we'll go producing glory right here great gobs and chunks of it you griffith put down that gun or i'll knock your fool head off i'm taking charge of this outfit now and don't you forget it and i don't want no maniac wandering round me with a gun you go to gathering up wood as fast as ever god let you say i was mistaken said the deposed leader thoroughly convinced once more you do look like bansford you know he laid down his rifle obediently look like your grandmother's left hind foot sneered the outraged miner my eyes is brown and so's bransford's outside of that no but you do a little said his ally steele i noticed it myself last night not much but still there's a resemblance poor cap griffith just let his nerves and imagination run away with him that's all long sniffed funny i never heard of it before he said he was somewhat mollified nevertheless and while cooking breakfast he received very graciously a stammered and half-hearted apology from young mr griffith now reduced to the ranks oh that's all right kid but say you be careful and don't shoot your partner when he comes back gurdon brought back the sorrel horse and the saddle thereby allaying mr long's wrathful mistrust that the whole affair was a practical joke i told you butter wouldn't suit the works said rex triumphantly and watched the working of his test with a jealous eye long knew his alice but it was the best butter he said he surveyed the sorrel horse his eyes brightened we'll whack up that blood money yet he announced confidently now i'm going to walk over to the south side and get one of those fellows to ride sign round the mountain you boys can sleep turn and turn about till i get back then i want steele to go to escondido and wire up to arcadia that we got our bear by the tail and want help to turn him loose and tell pappy sanders to send me out some grub or i'll skin him pappy's putting up for the mine you know i'll stay here and keep an eye on griffith he gave that luckless warrior a jeering look as one who has forgiven but not forgotten why don't you ride one of our horses said gurdon want to keep him fresh then if bransford gets out over the cliffs you can run him down like a mad dog said toby besides if i ride a fresh horse in here he'll maybe shoot me to get the horse and if he could catch you lads away from shelter maybe so he'd make a dash for it a shootin see here if i was dodgin in here like him know what i'd do i just shoot a few lines on general principles to draw you away from the gates then if you went in to see about it i'd either kill you if i had to or slip out if you give me the chance you just stay right here whatever happens keep under shelter and keep your horses right by you we got em bottled up and we won't draw the cork till the sheriff come i'll tell him to do the same way at the other end i won't take any gun with me and i'll stick to the main road that way bransford won't feel no call to shoot me likely he's way up in the cliffs anyhow ride the sorrel horse then why don't you he isn't lame enough to hurt much but he's lame enough that bransford won't want him thus mr griffith again dissimulating every detail of mr long's plan forestalled suspicion that these measures were precisely calculated to disarm suspicion now occurred to griffith's stubborn mind for he had a stubborn mind the morning's coffee had cleared it of cobwebs and it clung more tenaciously than ever to the untenable and thrice exploded theory that long and bransford were one and inseparable now and for ever he meditated an ungenerous scheme for vindication 
and to that inn wished mr long to ride the sorrel horse for mr long if he were indeed the murderer as of course he was would indubitably upon some plausible pretext attempt to pass the guards at the farther end of the trip where was no clear-eyed griffith on guard what more plausible that a modification of the plan already rehearsed for long to tell the wardens that griffith had sent him to telegraph to the sheriff let him once pass those warders on any pretext that would be final betrayal for all his shrewdness there was no possibility that long and bransford could complete their escape on that lame sorrel he would not be allowed to get much of a start just enough to betray himself then he griffith would bring him back in triumph it was a good scheme all things considered it reflected great credit upon mr griffith's imagination as in poe's game of odd or even where you must outguess your opponent and follow his thought mr rex griffith had guessed correctly in every respect such indeed had been mr long's plan only rex did not guess quite often enough mr long had guessed just one layer deeper namely that mr griffith would follow his thought correctly and also follow him therefore mr long switched again it was a bully game better than poker mr long enjoyed it very much just as rex expected toby allowed himself to be overpersuaded and rode the sorrel horse he renamed the sorrel horse goldie on the spot saddled him awkwardly mounted in like manner and rode into the shadowy depths of double mountain once he was out of sight mr griffith followed despite the angry protest of mr steele alleging falsely that he was going to try for a deer toby rode slowly up the crooked and brush-lined canyon behind him cautiously hidden came griffith the hawk-eyed avenger waiting at each bend until mr long had passed the next one for closer observation of how mr long bore himself in solitude mr long bore himself most disappointingly he rode slowly and awkwardly scanning with anxious care the hillsides before him not once did he look back lest he should detect mr griffith near the summit the goldie horse shied and jumped it was only one little jump whereunto goldie had been privately instigated by mr long's thumb thumbing a horse as done by one conversant with equine anatomy produces surprising results but it caught mr long unawares and tumbled him ignominiously in the dust mr long sat in the sand and rubbed his shoulder goldie turned and looked down at him in unqualified astonishment mr long then cursed mr branford's sorrel horse he cursed mr bransford for bringing the sorrel horse he cursed himself for riding the sorrel horse he cursed mr griffith with one last longest heartfelt crackling hair-raising comprehensive and masterly curse for having persuaded him to ride the sorrel horse then he tied the sorrel horse to a bush and hobbled on foot saying it all over backward poor griffith experienced the most intense mortification except one of his life this was conclusive bransford was reputed the best rider in rainbow this was long he was convinced positively finally and irrevocably he did not even follow mr long to the other side of double mountain but turned back to camp keeping a sharp eye out for traces of the real bransford to no effect it was only by chance a real chance that clambering on the gatepost cliffs to examine a curious whorl of gneiss he happened to see mr long as he returned mr long came afoot leading the sorrel horse just before he came within sight of camp he led the horse up beside a boulder climbed clumsily into the saddle clutched the saddle horn and so rode into camp the act was so natural a one that griffith already convinced was convinced again the more so because long preserved a discreet silence as to the misadventure with the sorrel horse 
mr long reported profanely that the men on the other side had also been disposed to arrest him and had been dissuaded with difficulty so i guess i must look some like bransford though i would never a guessed it reckon nobody knows what they really look like chances are a feller wouldn't know himself if he met him in the road that squares you kid no hard feelings not a bit i certainly thought you were bransford at first said griffith well the black-eyed one stone he's coming round on the west side now cutting the sign you be all ready to start for escondido as soon as he gets here gird say you don't want to wait for the sheriff if he's up on rainbow you wire a lot of your friends to come on the train at nine o'clock to-night sheriff can come when he gets back there ain't but a few horses at escondido you get pappy sanders to send your gang out in a wagon such as can't find horses better take in both of ours gird said griffith he knew long was all right as has been said but he was also newly persuaded of his own fallibility he had been mistaken about long being bransford therefore he might be mistaken about long being long in this spirit of humility he made the suggestion recorded above and was grieved that long endorsed it and i want you to do two errands for me kid you give this to pappy sanders the storekeeper you know here he produced the little eopus from his pocket and tell him to send it to a jeweler for me and get a hole bored in it so it'll balance want to use it for a watch charm when i get a watch and if we pull off this bransford affair i'll have me a watch now don't you lose that it's turquoise worth a heap of money besides he's a lucky little horse i'll put him in my pocket-book said gurdon better give him to pappy first off else you're liable to forget about him he's so small then you tell pappy to send me out some grub i won't make out no bill he's grub stake in the mine he'll know what to send you just tell him i'm about out of patience tell him i want about everything there is and i want it quick and a jar for sourdough i broke mine and get some newspapers he hesitated perceptibly see here boys i hate to mention this but old pappy m and this jeff bransford is pretty good friends i reckon pappy won't much like it to furnish grub for you while you're puttin the kibosh on jeff you better get some of your own you see how it is don't you tain't like it was my chuck stone came while they saddled he spoke apart with griffith as to mr long and a certain favour he bore to the escaped bank robber but griffith admitting his own self-deception in that line outlined the history of the past unhappy night stone who had suffered only a slight misgiving was fully satisfied as steele started for the railroad mr stone set out to complete the circuit of double mountain in the which he found no runaway tracks and griffith and long sleeping alternately especially griffith kept faithful ward over the gloomy gate of double mountain End of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Flight. Keep away from that wheelbarrow. What the hell do you know about machinery? Elbert Hubbard. Just after dark, a horseman with a lead horse came jogging round the mountain on the trail from Escondido on the lad horse was a pack bound rather slouchily not to a pack saddle but to an old riding saddle the horses were unwilling to enter the circle of firelight so the rider drew rein just beyond a slender and boyish rider with a flopping wide-brimmed hat too large for him oh look who's here said toby as one who greets an unexpected friend hello toby here's your food grub chuck and provisions got your outlaw yet them other fellows will be out along toward midnight he went on without waiting for an answer put me on your payroll pappy said i was to go to work and if you was going to quit work to hunt down his friend you'd better quit for good lead on to your little old mine i don't know where it is even i'll go up and unpack rex said toby but of course i'm not going to lose my part of that five thousand pappy's foolish he's getting old 
i'll be back after a while and bring down the papers chatting of the trapped outlaw the ophir men climbed the zigzag to the mine to griffith their voices dwindled to an indistinct murmur a light glowed through the tent on the dump the stranger pressed into jeff's hand something small and hard the little eopus here's your little old token pappy caught on at once and he sent me along to represent let's get this pack off and get out of here do we have to go down the same trail again oh no said jeff there's a wood trail leads round the mountain to the east who are you i don't know you charlie gibson pappy knows me he sent the little stone horse to vouch for me i'm okay time enough to explain when we've made a clean getaway you're damn right there said jeff that boy down yonder is nobody's fool i'll light a candle in the tent and he'll think i'm reading the newspapers that'll hold him a while i'll be going on down the trail said gibson this way isn't it yes that's the one all right go slow and don't make any more noise than you can help jeff would have liked his own proper clothing and effects but there was no time for resuscitation lighting the candle he acquired alice in wonderland and thrust it into the bosom of his shirt it had been years since last he read that admirable work his way now led either to hiding or to jail and with alice to share his fate he felt equal to either fortune he left the candle burning the tent shone with a mellow glow if he didn't hear our horses coming down we're a little bit of all right said jeff as he rejoined his rescuer on the level even if he does he may think we've gone to hobble em only he'd think we ought to water em first now for the way of the transgressor to old mexico this little desert will be one busy place to-morrow they circled double mountain making a wide detour to avoid rough going and riding at a hard gallop until behind and to their right a red spark of fire came into view from behind a hitherto intervening shoulder marking where stone and harlow held the southward pass jeff drew rein and bore off obliquely toward the road at an easy trot they're there yet so that's all right he said they've just put on fresh wood i saw it flame up just then he was in high feather he began to laugh or more accurately he resumed his laughter for he had been too mirthful for much speech that poor devil griffith will wait and fidget and stew he'll think i'm in the tent reading the newspapers reading about the arcadian bank robbery likely he'll wait a while then he'll yell at me then he'll think we've gone to hobble the horses he won't want to leave the gap unguarded he won't know what to think finally he'll go up to the mine and see that pack piled off any which way and no saddles then he'll know but he won't know what to do he'll think we're for old mexico but he won't know it for sure and it's too dark to track us oh my stars but i bet he'll be mad which shows that we all make mistakes mr griffith though young was of firm character as has been lightly intimated he waited a reasonable time to allow for paper reading then he waited a little longer and shouted but when there was no answer he knew at once precisely what had happened he had not been a fool at all whatever steele and bransford had assured him and he was a bigger fool to have allowed himself to be persuaded that he had been it is true that he didn't know what was best to do but he knew exactly what he was going to do and did it promptly seriously annoyed he spurred through double mountain gathered up stone and harlow and followed the southward road bransford had been on the way to old mexico he was on that road still griffith put everything on the one bold cast while the other saddled he threw fresh fuel on the fire with a rankling memory of the candle in the deserted tent and hannibal at st joe for the first time griffith had the better of the long battle of wits that armful of fuel slowed jeff from gallop to trot turned assured victory into a doubtful contest when the fugitives regained the el paso road griffith's vindictive little band was not five miles behind them the night was lightly clouded not so dark but that the pursuers noticed or thought they noticed the fresh tracks in the road when they came to them they stopped struck matches and confirmed their hopes two shod horses going south at a smart gait the dirt was torn up too much for travellers on their lawful occasions 
from that moment griffith urged the chase unmercifully the fleeing couple in fancied security lost ground with every mile how on earth did you manage it didn't they know you demanded gibson as the pace slackened oh, it wasn't me it was toby long you may not have lived much under the sea and perhaps you were never even introduced to a lobster quoted jeff rocking in the saddle he gave a mirthful resume of his little evanishment and oh just think of that candle burning away in that quiet empty tent if i could have seen griffith's faith he gloated oh me oh my and he was so sure say gibson how do you come in this galley as a lone prospector his speech had been fittingly coarse now with every mile he shook off the debasing influence of mr long kettle washing makes black hands aren't you afraid you'll get into trouble nobody knows i'm kettle washing except pappy sanders and you said gibson i was careful not to let your friends see me at the fire i'll do you a good turn sometime said jeff he rode on in silence for a while and presently was lost in his own thoughts leaning over with his hands folded on his horse's neck in a low and thoughtful voice he half repeated half chanted to himself il leo le gardi in the garden there alone there came to me no murmur of the fountain's undertone so mystically magically mellow as your own another silence then jeff roused himself with a start i tell you what gibson you'd better cut loose from me so far as i can see you are only a kid you don't want to get mixed up in a murder scrape this would go pretty hard with you if they can prove it on you of course i'm awfully obliged to you and all that but you'd better quit me while the quitting's good oh no i'll see you through said gibson lightly besides i know you had nothing to do with the murder oh the hell you do said jeff that's kind of you i'm sure see here who sold you your chips anyway how'd you get in this game well i got in this game as you put it because i jolly well wanted to replied charlie with becoming spirit that ought to be reason enough for anything in this country nothing against it in the rules and i don't use the rules anyhow if you must have it all spelled out for you i knew or at least i'd heard that your friends were away from rainbow so i judged you wouldn't go up there then i knew those four amateur sherlocks there in my set in arcadia when two of the deer hunters after starting at two a m came back to arcadia the same morning they left looking all wise and important and slipped off on the train to escondido saying nothing to any one and when the other two didn't come home at all i began to think went down to the depot found they had gone to escondido and i came on the next train i found out pappy was your friend and when he got your little hurry-up call volunteered my services seeing pappy was too old and not footloose anyhow with a wife and property that's the how of it oh yes that's all right but what makes you think i'm innocent i know mr white you see and mr white seems to think that at about the time the bank was robbed you were uh, in a garden charlie's voice was edged with faint mockery ah said jeff startled who in hell is mr white uh, mr white in hell is the devil said charlie at this unexpected disclosure jeff lashed his horse to a gallop his spurs you remember being certain feet under the ophir dump and strove to bring his thoughts to bear upon this new situation he slowed down and charlie drew up beside him you seem to have stayed quite a while in a garden suggested charlie that tongue of yours is going to get you into trouble yet said jeff you'll never live to be gray-headed charlie was not to be daunted say jeff she's pretty easy to get acquainted with what and those eyes of hers a little on the see you later style aren't they jeff turned in his saddle now you look here mr charlie gibson i'm under obligation to you and so on but i've heard all of that kind of talk that's good Tabe? oh i know her persisted charlie know her by heart know her like a book she made a fool of me too she drives em single double tandem random and four abreast you little beast jeff launched his horse at the traducer but gibson spurred aside stop now jeffy easy does it i've got a gun 
shut your damn head then gun or no gun don't you take that girl's name in your mouth again or hark what's that it was a clatter far behind a ringing of swift hoofs on hard ground by george they're coming griffith will be a man yet said jeff approvingly come on kid we've got to burn the breeze i suppose that talk of yours is only your damn fool idea of fun but i don't like it cut it out now and ride like a drunk indian he laughed loud and long think of that candle will you burnin away with a clear bright steady flame and nobody within ten miles of it they raced side by side but gibson heedless of their perilous situation or perhaps taking advantage of it took a malicious delight in goading jeff to madness and he refused either to be silent or to talk about candles notwithstanding jeff's preference for that topic i'm not joking i'm telling you for your own good here the tormentor prudently fell back half a length and raised his voice so as to be heard above the flying feet hasn't she gone back to new york i'd like to know and left you to get out of it the best way you can she could have stayed if she'd wanted to don't tell me haven't i seen how she bosses her mother around no sir she's willing to let you hang to save herself a little slander or more likely a little talk jeff whirled his horse to his haunches but once more gibson was too quick for him gibson's horse was naturally the nimbler of the two even without the advantage of spurs that's a lie she was going to tell she was bound to tell i made her keep silent after i jumped out she couldn't well say anything that's why i jumped was i going to make her a target for such vile tongues as yours for me oh you ought to be shot out of a red-hot cannon through a barbed wire fence into hell you lie you coward you know you lie i'll cram it down your throat if you'll get off and throw that gun down yeah it's likely i'll put the gun down scoffed gibson right on you fool do you want to hang right on and keep ahead remember i've got a gun hanging's not so bad snarled jeff i'd rather be hung decently than be such a thing as you oh if i just had a gun the sound of pursuit was clearer now and of course the pursuers could hear the pursued as well and fought for every inch jeff rode on furious at his helplessness for several miles his tormentor raced behind in silence fearing if he persisted longer in his evil course that jeff would actually stop and give himself up they gained now on their pursuers who had pressed their horses over hard to make up the five-mile handicap as they came to a patch of sandy ground they eased the pace somewhat charlie drew a little closer to jeff now don't get mad i had no idea you thought so much of the girl shut up will you or i wouldn't have deviled you so i'll quit how was i to know you'd stop to fight for her with the very rope around your neck it's a pity she'll never know about it you can't have seen her more than two or three times and heaven only knows where that was on that camping trip i reckon what kind of a girl is she anyhow to hold clandestine interviews with a stranger she'll write to you by and by a little scented note with a little stilted meaningless word of thanks no she won't it'll be gushy oh my dear hero how can i ever repay you she won't let you out of her clutches anybody so long as it's a man there none of that go on now if you want to live who the hell wants to live a noose flew back from the darkness jeff's horse darted aside and gibson was jerked sprawling to the sand at the rope's end hat flew one way gun another jeff ran to the six-shooter who's got the gun now he jeered as he loosened the rope i only wish we had two of em you hair-brained idiot charlie grabbed up his hat and spit sand from his mouth get your horse and ride you unthinkable donkey pleasure first business afterward jeff unbuckled gibson's gun belt and transferred it to his own waist jerking gibson to his feet in the violent process now you little blackguard you either take back all that or you'll get the licking of your life you're too small but all the same oh i'll take it back you big bully all i said and a lot more i only thought said charlie spitefully he was almost crying with rage as he limped to his horse she's an angel on earth sure she is ride you maniac ride or you ought to be hung i hope you do hang you miserable ruffian 
the following hoofs no longer rang sharply they took on a muffled beat they were on the sand's edge not a mile behind right ahead you i've got the gun remember observed jeff significantly but if you slur that girl again i'll not shoot you i'll naturally wear you out with this belt End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Goodbye. They have ridden the low moon out of the sky, their hoofs drum up the dawn. Two strong men, Kipling. I'm not speaking of her now, and I'm not going to, protested Gibson in a changed tone. I'll promise. My horse is failing, Jeff i rode hard and fast from escondido your horse carried nothing much but a saddle that pack was mostly bluff you know and those fellows horses have come twenty miles less than either of ours no answer i don't believe we're going to make it jeff there was a forlorn little quaver in charlie's voice jeff grunted eh, maybe not griffith'll be real pleased gibson rode closer can't we turn off the road and hide till daylight said jeff then they'll get us no way out of this desert except across the edges somewhere you go if you want to they won't bother to hunt for you maybe if they get me no it's my fault i'll see it out i'm sorry jeff but it was so funny here rather to jeff's surprise charlie's dejection gave place to laughter they rode up a sandy slope where mesquites grew black along the road blown sand had lodged to hummocks in their thick and matted growth the road was a sunken way how far is it from here jeff ten miles maybe only eight to the river we're in texas now have been for an hour think we can make it quien sabe gibson drew rein you go on your horse isn't so tired oh i guess not said jeff come on the sound of pursuit came clear through the quiet night there was silence for a while what do you do jeff fight i can't said jeff hurt those boys i couldn't fight the way it is hardly even if twas the sheriff i'll just hang i reckon they reached the top of the little slope and turned down the other side i don't altogether like this hangin idea said gibson i got you into this jeff so i'll just get you out again like the man in our town who was so wondrous wise going to use bramble bushes too volatile gibson in the stress of danger had forgotten his wrath he was light-hearted happy frivolously gay give me your rope and your gun jeff quick now no i won't mention your girl not once hurry what are you going to do asked jeff thoroughly mystified ever read the fool's errand charlie chuckled no well i have jump off and tie the end of your rope to that mesquite root quick he sprang down, snatched one end of the coil from Jeff's hand, and stretched it taut across the road, a foot from the ground. Now your gun, quick. He snatched the gun, tied an end of his own saddle rope to the stretched one near the middle, plunged through the mesquite over a hummock, paying out his rope as he went, wedged the gun firmly in the springing crotch of a mesquite tree, cocked it, and tied the loose end of the trailing rope to the trigger. He ran back and sprang on his horse now ride it's our last chance kid you're a wonder said jeff you'll do to take along they'll lope off when they turn down that slope hit that rope and pile in a heap and my rope will fire the gun off shrilled joyous charlie they'll think it's us and an ambuscade they'll take to the sand hills jeff broke in they'll shoot into the bushes they'll think it's us firing back half the time they'll scatter out and surround that lonesome harmless mott and watch it till daylight you bet they won't go projecting round it any till daylight either he looked up at the sky there's the morning star see it they have ridden the low moon out of the sky only there isn't any moon their hoofs drum up the dawn then they'll find our tracks and if i only could see the captain's face oh my threshings and the corn of my floor and by then we'll be in mexico and asleep when griffith finds that gun oh he'll never show his head in arcadia again say charlie i hope none of em get hurt when they strike your skip rope 
Ah, it's Sandy, a heap you cared about me getting hurt when you dragged me from my horse, said Gibson rather snappishly. You did hurt me, too. You nearly broke my neck and you cut my arms, and I got full of mesquite thorns when I set that gun. You don't care. I'm only the man that came to save your neck. That's the thanks I get. But the men that are trying to hang you... That's different. You'd better go back. They might get hurt. You'll be sorry sometime for the way you've treated me. There. It's too late now. A shot rang behind them. There was a brief silence. Then came a sharp fusillade, followed by scattering shots dwindling to longer intervals. Jeff clung to his saddle horn. I guess they ain't hurt much, he laughed. Wish I could see em when they find out. Slow down, kid. We've got lots of time now. We haven't, protested Charlie. Keep moving. It's hard on the horses, but they'll have a lifetime to rest in. They've telegraphed all over the country. You want to cross the river before daylight. It will be too bad for you to be caught now. Is there any ford, do you know? Not this time of year. River's up. Cross in a boat, then? Guess we'd better. That horse of yours is pretty well used up. Don't believe he could swim it. Oh, I'm not going over. I'll get up to El Paso. I've got friends there. You'll get caught. No, I won't. I'm not going across, I tell you, and that's all there is to it. I guess I'll have something to say about things. I'm going to see you safely over, and that's the last you'll ever see of Charlie Gibson. Oh, well, Jeff reflected a little. If you're sure you won't come along, I'd rather swim. My horse is strong yet. You see, it takes time to find a boat, and a boat means a house and dogs, and I'll need my horse on the other side. How will you get to El Paso? Griffith will likely come down here about an hour by sun. Cross lots a-crying. I'll manage that, said Gibson, curtly enough. You tend to your own affair. Oh, all right. Jeff rode ahead. He whistled, and then he chanted his war song. Said the little Eopas, I'm gonna be a horse, and on my middle fingernails to run my earthly course. The Coryophodon was horrified, the Ninocaris was shocked, and they chased young Eohippus, but he skipped away and mocked. Said they, you always were as small and mean as now we see, and that's conclusive evidence that you're always going to be. What, be a great tall handsome beast with hoofs to gallop on? Why, you'll have to change your nature, said the Loxlow Fondaton. Jeff. Well, Jeff turned his head. Charlie was drooping visibly. Stop that foolish song. Jeff rode on in silence. This was a variable person, Gibson. They were dropping down from the mesa into the valley of the Rio Grande. Jeff. Jeff fell back beside Charlie. Tire partner? Jeff, I'm terribly tired. I'm not used to riding so far, and I'm sleepy. So sleepy. All right, partner, we'll go slower. We'll walk. Most there now. There's the railroad. Keep on trotting. I can stand it. We must get to the river before daylight. Is it far? Charlie's voice was weary. The broad sombrero drooped sympathetically. Two miles to the river. El Paso seven or eight miles up the line. Brace up, old man. You've done fine and dandy. It's just because the excitement is all over. Why should you go any farther anyhow? There's Isleta up the track a bit. Follow the road up there and flag the first train. That'll be best. No, no, I'll go all the way. I'll make out. Charlie straightened himself with an effort. They crossed the Espy track and came to a lane between cultivated fields. Jeff, I'd like to say something. It won't be breaking my promise, really. I didn't mean what I said about, uh, you know, I was only teasing. She's a good enough girl, I guess, as girls go. Jeff nodded. I did not need to be told that. And you left her in a cruel position when you jumped out of the window. She can't tell now, so long as there's any other way. What a foolish thing to do. If you just said at first that you were in the garden... Oh, why didn't you? But after the chances you took, rather than to tell, why, Jeff, it would be terrible for her now. I know that, too, said Jeff. I suppose I was a fool, but I didn't want her to get mixed up with it, and at the same time I cared less about hanging than any time I can remember. You see, I didn't know till the last minute that the garden was going to cut any figure. And do you suppose I'd have that courthouse full of fools buzzing and whispering at her? Not much. Maybe it was foolish, but I'm glad I did it. 
i'm glad of it too if you had to be a fool said charlie i'm glad you were that kind of fool are you still mad at me since charlie had recanted and more especially since he had taken considerate thought for the girl's compulsory silence jeff's anger had evaporated oh, that's all right partner only you oughtn't never to talk that way about a girl even for a joke that's no good kind of a joke men now that's different see here i'll give you an order to a fellow in el paso hibbler to pay for your horses and your gun here's your belt too charlie shook his head impatiently i don't want any money settle with pappy for the horses i won't take this one back keep the belt you may want it to beat me with some time what are you going to do jeff aren't you ever coming back sure i'll come back if only to see griffith again i'll write to john wesley pringle he's my mainest side partner and sick him on to find out who robbed that bank to prove it rather i just about almost nearly know who it was old wessel straightened things out of flyin i'll be back in no time i gotta come back charlie the river was in sight the stars were fading there was a flush in the east a smell of dawn in the air jeff i wish you'd do something for me sure charlie what is it I wish you'd give me that little turquoise horse to remember you by. Jeff was silent for a while. He had framed out another plan for the little Eopas, namely to give him to Miss Eleanor. He sighed, but he owed a good deal to Charlie. All right, Charlie, take good care of him. He's a lucky little horse. I think a heap of him. Here we are. The trees were distinct in the growing light. Jeff rode into the river. The muddy river swirled about his horse's knees he halted for parting gibson rode in beside him jeff took the precious alice book from his bosom put it in the crown of his miner's cap and jammed the cap tightly on his head better change your mind charlie come along we'll root somebody out and find a dish of stewed eggs there is another shore you know upon the other side the farther off from england the nearer tis to france then turn not pale beloved snail but come and join the dance will you won't you no i won't i told you once snapped the beloved snail here's the little eopas horse then as charlie took it jeff wrung his hand by george i've got to change my notion of arcadia people if there's many like you and griffith arcadia's going to crowd the map well so long it looks awful wide jeff oh i'll be all right swim it myself if the horse plays out and if i don't have no cramps as i might of course after this ride well here goes nothing take care of the little horse i hope he brings you good luck well so long then bransford rode into the muddy waters they came to the horse's breast his neck he plunged in sank rose and was borne away down the swift current breasting the flood stoutly and so went quartering across to the farther bank it took a long time it was quite light when the horse found footing on a sandbar half a mile below rested and splashed whitely through the shallows to the bank gibson swung his sombrero jeff waved his hand rode to the fringing bushes and was gone End of chapter fifteen Chapter 16 of Bransford of Rainbow Range by Eugene Manlove Rhodes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 The Land of Afternoon. Dreaming once more, love's old sad dream divine. Los Banos de Santa Eulalia del Norte, otherwise known as Mud Springs, is a Mexican hamlet with one street of about the same length los banos and company lies in a loop of the rio grande half of a long day from el paso in mere miles otherwise a contemporary of damascus and arpad thither mindful of the hot springs which supply the preliminaries of the name mr bransford made his way mindful too of sturdy old don francisco a friend twice bound by ancient service given and returned he climbed the slow long ridges to the high mesa for the river bent here in a long oxbow where a bold promontory shouldered far out to bar the way weary miles were to be saved by crossing the neck of this oxbow and the tough horse tired and lagged the slow sun rose as he reached the rim 
it showed the wide expanse of desert behind him flooded with trembling light eastward beyond the river the buttressed and fantastic peaks of fray cristobal their jutting shadows streaming into the gulf beyond athwart the silvery ribbon of gleaming water twining in mazy loops across the valley floor it showed the black rim at his feet a frowning level wall of lava cliff where the plain broke abruptly into the chasm beneath the iron desolation of the steep sides boulder strewn savage and forbidding a land of old up heaven from the abyss long since there had been a flourishing mexican town in the valley a wagon road had painfully climbed a long ridge to the rim twisting doubling turning clinging hazardously to the hillside its outer edge a wall built up with stone till it came to the shoulder under the tremendous barrier from there it turned northward paralleling the rim in a mile-long curve above a deep gorge turning in a last desperate climb to a solitary gateway in the black wall torn out by floodwaters through slow centuries smallpox had smitten the people the treacherous river had devastated the fertile valley and subsiding left the rich fields a waste of sand the town was long deserted the disused road was gullied and torn by flood the soil washed away leaving a heaped and crumbled track of tangled stone but it was the only practicable way as far as the sand hills and jeff led his horse down the ruined path with many a turning back and a scrambling detour the shadows of the eastern hills drew back before him as he reached the sand dunes when he rode through the silent streets of what had been alamosita the sun peered over fray cristobal gilding the crumbling walls where love and laughter had made music where youth and hope and happiness had been silent now and deserted given over to lizard and bat and owl the smiling gardens choked with sand and grass springing with mesquite and tornillo a few fruit trees gnarled and tangled drooping for days departed when young mothers sang low lullaby beneath their branches passed away and forgotten hopes and fears tears and smiles birth and death joy and sorrow hatred and sin and shame falsehood and truth and courage and love the sun shone cheerfully on these grey ruins as it has shone on a thousand such and will shine jeff turned down the river past the broken asiquius to where a massive spur of basaltic rock had turned the fury of the floods and spared a few fields in this sheltered cove dwelt don francisco escobar in true pastoral and patriarchal manner his stalwart sons and daughters with their sons and daughters in turn in clustering adobes around him for neighbors the allied family of gonzales y ortega a cheerful settlement this of los baños nestling at the foot of the friendly rampart sheltered alike from flood and wind south and west the close black rim walled the horizon the fantasy of fray with the ball closed in the narrow east but northward beyond the low sand hills and the blue heat haze the high peaks of Oregon, guadalupe and rainbow swam across the sleepy air far and soft and dim in their fields the gente of gonzales y ortega and of escobar raised ample crops of alfalfa wheat corn frijoles and chili with orchard vineyard and garden their cows sheep and goats grazed the foothills between river and rim watched by the young men or boys penned nightly in the great corrals in the old spanish fashion as if the moor still swooped and forayed their horses roamed the hills at will only a few being kept in the alfalfa pasture they ground their own grain tanned their cowhides at home mattress and pillow were wool of their raising their blankets and cloth their own weave there were granaries a wine press a forge a cumbrous stone mill a great adobe oven like a monstrous beehive once a year their oxen drew the great high-sided wagons up the sandy road to el paso and returned with the year's marketing salt axes iron and steel 
powder and lead bolts of white domestic or a manta for sheets and shirtlings matches tea coffee tobacco and sugar perhaps if the saints had been kind there were a few ribbons trinkets or brightly coloured prints of joseph and virgin and child st john the beloved the annunciation the children and christ perhaps an american rifle or a plough but for the most part they held not with innovations ploughed sowed and reaped as their fathers did threshing with oxen or goats the women sewed by hand cooked on fireplaces or better still in the open air under the trees with few and simple utensils the family ate from whitest and cleanest of sheepskins spread on the floor but the walls were snowy with whitewash the earthen floors smooth and clean the coarse linen fresh and white the scant furniture of the rooms a pine bed a chair or two a mirror a brass candlestick with homemade candles a cheap print on the wall a great chest for clothes blankets and simple treasures the bright fire in the cosy fireplace all combined to give an indescribable air of cheerfulness of homely comfort and of rest this quiet corner where people still lived as simply as when abraham went up from ur of the chaldees in the springtime of the world held for seeing eyes an incommunicable charm when jeff came at last to casa escobar the cattle were already on the hills the pigs and chickens far afield don francisco white-haired erect welcomed him eagerly indeed but with stately courtesy is it thou indeed my son now my old eyes are gladdened this day enter then amigo mio thrice welcome the house is thine in very truth nay the young men shall care for thy horse he raised his voice three tall sons abran zenobio donociano came at the summons gave bransford grave greeting and stood to await their father's commands fathers of families themselves they presumed not to sit unbidden to join in the conversation or to loiter breakfast was served presently in high state on the table reserved for honoured guests savoury venison chili fish eggs tortillas etoiles enchiladas cream and steaming coffee such was the fare don francisco sat gravely by to bear him company while a silently hovering damsel anticipated every need thence when his host could urge no more upon him to the deep shading cottonwoods wine was brought and the makings of cigarettes corn husks hand cut a great jar of tobacco and a brazier of mesquite embers at a little distance women washed wove or sewed the young men made buckskin fashioned quirts whips ropes bridle reins tie straps hobbles pack sacks and chaparejos of rawhide made cinches of horsehair wrought ox yokes plough beams and other things needful for their simple husbandry meanwhile don francisco entertained his guest with grave and leisurely recital of the year's annals mateo son of sebastian had slain a great bear in the pass of all the winds alicia daughter of their eldest was wed with young roman de la o of cañada nogales to the much healing of feud and ancient hatred diego son of usibio was proving a bold and fearless rider of wild horses with reason as behooved his father's son he had carried away the gallo at the fiesta de san juan with the fleet dung colt creased from the wild bunch at quemado the herds had grown the crops prospered all sorrow passed them by through the intercession of the blessed saints the year's trophies were brought he fingered with simple pride the great pelt of the silver tip antlers there were and lion skins gleaming prisms of quartz flint arrowheads and agates brought in by the shepherds the costly navajo blanket won by the fleet-limbed dun at cañada races hither came presently another visitor florentino baker of wild horses despite his fifty years wizened and withered and small 
merry and cheerful singer of forgotten folk songs chanting even as he came the song of macario romero macario riding joyous and light-hearted spite of warning omen and sign love lured to doom and death concedama una licencia voi a ir a ver a me chata dice macario romero parando en los estribos madre pues esto voy a ver si todos son mis amigos and so listening weary and outworn jeff fell asleep observe now how nature insists upon averages mr jeff bransford was as has been seen an energetic man but outraged nerves will have their revenge after making proper amends to his damaged eye jeff's remnant of energy kept up long enough to dispatch young thomas escobar y mendoza to el paso with a message to hibbler which message enjoined hibbler at once to carry tidings to john wesley pringle somewhere in chihuahua asking him kindly to set right what arcadian times were out of joint as he jeff felt the climate of old mexico more favourable for his throat trouble than that of new mexico with a postscript asking hibbler for money by bearer and young tomas was instructed to buy at juarez a complete outfit of clothing for jeff including a gun this done the reaction set in aided perhaps by the enervating lassitude of the hot baths and the sleepy atmosphere of that forgotten village jeff spent the better part of a week asleep or half awake at best he had pleasant dreams too one perhaps the best dream of all was that on their wedding trip they should follow again the devious line of his flight from arcadia that would need a prairie schooner no a prairie steamboat a prairie yacht he could tell her all the hideous details show her the mine the camp of the besiegers the ambuscade on the road and if he could have eleanor meet griffith and gibson for a crowning touch after the strenuous violence of hand-strokes here was a drowsy and peaceful time the wine of that land was good the shade pleasant the elysian philosophy more delightful than of yore he had all the accessories but one of an earthly paradise man is ungrateful jeff was a man neglectful of present bounties his dreaming thoughts were all of the absent accessory and of a time when that absence should be no more nor paradise be empty life like the griffin's classical master had taught him laughter and grief he turned now the forgotten pages of the book of his years enough black pages were there as you will know well having yourself searched old records before now with tears he cast up that long account the wasted lendings the outlawed debts the dishonoured promises the talents of his stewardship unprofitable and brought to naught set down how gladly the items on the credit side so men have set the good upon one side and the evil on the other side since crusoe's days and before against the time when the great accountant whose values are not ours shall strike a final balance take that book at your elbow yes either one it doesn't matter now turn to where the hero first discovers his frightful condition long after it has become a neighbourhood property he bent his head in humility he was not worthy of her something like that those may not be the precise words but he groaned he always groans by the way how this man-saying must amuse womankind yes and they actually say it too real live flesh and blood men who was it said life was a poor imitation of literature happily either these people are insincere or they reconsider the matter else what might we do for families it is to be said that jeff bransford lacked this becoming delicacy if he groaned he swore also if he decided that miss eleanor hoffman deserved a better man than he was he also highly resolved that she should not have him for after all you know said jeff to alice 
i'm sure he's nothing extra a quiet man and plain and modest though there isn't much of which he could be vain and had i mind to chant his praise this were the kindest line somehow she loves him dearly this little love of mine End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen twentieth century and there that hulking prejudice sat all across the road i took my hat i took my coat my load i settled fair i approached that awful incubus with an absent-minded air and i walked directly through him as if he wasn't there an obstacle charlotte perkins stetson johnny dinas rode with a pleasant jingle down the shady street of los banos de santa eulalia del norte his saddle was new a carven wrought with silver his bridle shone as the sun his spurs as bright stars he shed music from his feet jeff saw him turn to casa escobar apple blossoms made a fragrant lane for him he paused at jeff's tree alto ali said johnny the words as sharp command can be managed in two brisk syllables the sound is then all we it is a crisp and startling sound and the sense of it in our idiom is hands up jeff had been taking a late breakfast al fresco he made glad room on his bench light stranger and look at your saddle pretty slick saddle too guess your playmates must have went home talking to themselves last night they're going to kill a maverick for you at arcadia and give a barbecue said johnny the cult of neil admirari reaches its highest pitch of prosperity in the cow countries and johnny knew that it was for him to broach tidings unasked oh that reminds me how's old lars porcina said jeff now free to question him he's all right said johnny casually gonna marry one or more of the nurses they're holding elimination contests now say johnny when you go back i wish you'd tell him i didn't do it cross my heart and hope to die if i did oh he knows it wasn't you said johnny jeff shook his head doubtfully evidence was pretty strong pretty strong who was it then why blake himself the old hog if lake keeps on like this he's going to have people down on him said jeff who did the homesing john wesley oh john wesley john wesley said dina scornfully you think the sun rises and sets in old john wesley pringle nah he didn't get back till it was all over i cannot tell a lie i did it with my little hatchet must have had it sharpened up said jeff tell it to me why there isn't much to tell said dina suddenly modest come to think of it i had a right considerable help there was a young college chap he first put it into my head that it wasn't you that would be the devil said jeff ignoring the insult just so a name's white and so's he billy white s m and g p i don't just remember them degrees said jeff ah keep still and you'll hear more they stand for some man and good people well as i was a sayin billy he seemed to think it wasn't you he stuck to it that badinsky that's what he calls you was in a garden just when the bank was robbed johnny contemplated the apple tree over his head it was a wandering and sober glance but a muscle twitched in his cheek and he made no further explanation about the garden and then i remembered about nigger babe throwing you off and i began to think maybe you didn't crack the safe after all and there was some other things little things that made billy and jimmy phillips he was taking cards in the game too made him think maybe it was lake but it wasn't no proof not to say proof and that's where i come in well said jeff as johnny paused simple enough once you knowed how said johnny modestly i'd been reading lots of them detective books sherlock holmes and all them fellas i got billy to have his folks stole lake's sister away for the night so she wouldn't be scared then me and billy and jimmy phillips and monte we broke in and blowed up lake's private safe no trouble at all since the bank robin every one's been tellin round just how it ought to be done crackin safes funny how a fella picks up little scraps of useful knowledge like that 
things you'd think he'd remember might come in handy most any time and then forgets all about em i wrote it down this time won't forget it again well said jeff again uh, oh yes and uh, there was the nice money all the notes and all the gold he could tote jeff's eye wandered to the new saddle i kept some of the yellow stuff as a souvenir half a quart or maybe a pint said johnny i don't want no reward for doing a good deed and that's all blake is a long ugly word said jeff thoughtfully well what do you say prompted johnny oh well, thank you thank you said jeff you showed marvellous penetration marvellous but say johnny if the money hadn't been there wouldn't that have been awkward oh billy was pretty sure lake was the man and we figured he hadn't bothered to move it you being the goat that way what made you be a goat jeff that whole performance was the most idiotic break i ever knew a grown-up man to get off i knew you were not strictly accountable but why didn't you say judge your honor sir at the time the bank was being robbed i was in a garden with a young lady talking about the hereafter the here and the heretofore on the contrary what made your billy think it was lake johnny told him in detail pretty good article of plain thinking wasn't it he concluded yet he mightn't have got started at all on the right track if he hadn't had the straight tip about your being in a garden johnny's eye reverted to the apple tree lake found your nose guard you know where you left it i reckon maybe he saw you leave it there say jeff lake's grandfather must have been a white man anyhow he's got one decent drop of blood in him from somewhere for when we arrested him he didn't say a word about the garden that was rather a good stunt i think bully for lake just once right you are and mr j Dennis, i've been thinking jeff began johnny glanced at him anxiously and i've about come to the conclusion that we're some narrow contracted and bigoted in rainbow we don't know it all we ain't the only pebble from what i've seen of these arcadia men they seem to be pretty good stuff and like as not it's just the same way all along the beach there's your mr white and griffith and gibson did i tell you about gibson johnny flashed a brilliant smile his smiles always looked larger than they really were because johnny was a very small man i saw griffith and he gave me his version uh, several times he's real upset griffith last time he told me he leaned up against my neck and wept because there was only ten commandments didn't see gibson did you you know him nope pappy picked him up or he picked pappy up rather hasn't been seen since i guess gibby old boy has gone to the wild bunch he wouldn't suspect you of being innocent and he dreamed he dwelt in marble halls making shoes for the state so he gets cold feet and he just naturally evaporates good night yes he said he was going to hike out or something to that effect responded jeff absently the fact being that he was not thinking of gibson at all but was pondering deep upon miss eleanor hoffman had she gone to new york according to the original plan it did not seem probable her face stood out before him bright vivid sparkling as he had seen her last in the courtroom of arcadia good heavens was that only a week ago seven days it seemed seven years no she had not gone at least certainly not until she was sure that he jeff had made good his escape then perhaps she might have gone perhaps her mother had made her go oh well new york wasn't far as he had told her that first wonderful day on rainbow rim what a marvellous day that was jeff was suddenly struck with the thought that he had never seen eleanor's mother great scott she had a father too how annoying he meditated upon this unpleasant theme for a space then as if groping in a dark room he had suddenly turned on the light his thought changed to what a girl ah what a wonderful girl where is she looking up jeff became once more aware of johnny Dines leg curled around the horn of the new saddle elbow on knee cheek on hand contemplating his poor friend with benevolent pity and then jeff knew that he could make no queries of johnny dines 
johnny spoke soothingly you are in north america this is the twentieth century your name is bransford that round bright object is the sun this direction is east this way is called up this is a stream of water that you see it is called the rio river grande big we are advertised by our loving friends i cannot sing the old songs there's a reason two of a kind flock together never trump your partner's ace it's a wise child that dreads the fire wake up come out of it change cars i ought to kill you said jeff now giggle you idiot and make everybody hate you wait till i say adios to my old compadre and the rest of the escobar gente and i'll side you to el paso not i little johnny he'll make san elizario's ferry by noon and helms by dark thought maybe so you'd be going along why no said jeff uneasily i guess maybe i'll go up to el paso and june around the spell oh well just as you say such bein' the case i'll be joggin better wait till after dinner i'll square it with don francisco if anything's missing no that makes too long a jaunt for this afternoon me for san elizario so long but beyond the first asequia he turned and rode back funny thing jeff remember me telling you about a girl i saw on may hill the day nigger babe throwed you off now what was that girl's name i've forgotten again oh, oh yes hoffman uh, miss eleanor hoffman well uh, she's at arcadia still the mother lady was all for going back to new york but no sir girl says she's twenty-one likes arcadia and she's going to stay a spell leastways so i hear i will kill you said jeff here wait till i saddle my nag and say good-bye beyond san elizario as they climbed the pass of all the winds the two friends halted to breathe their horses jeff said johnny rather soberly you can kick me after i say my little piece i'll think poorly of you if you don't but ain't you makin maybe a mistake that girl now nice girl and all that but that girl's got money jeff i hate a fool worse than a knave any day of the week said jeff and the man that would let money keep him from the only girl why johnny he's so much more of a fool than the other fellow is a scoundrel i get you said johnny you mean that a submarine boat is better built for rope and steers than a mogul engine is skilful at painting steeples and you wonder if you can't get a fresh horse somewhere and go on through to arcadia to-night uh, something like that admitted jeff besides he added lightly while i'd like that girl just as well if i didn't have a cent why as it happens i'm pretty well fixed myself i've got money to throw at the little dicky birds all kinds of money got a fifty-one per cent interest in a copper mine over at harquahala that's been paying me all the way from ten to five thousand clear per each and every year for the past seven years besides what i pay a lad for lookout to keep anybody but himself from stealing any of it he's been buying real estate for me in los angeles lately johnny's jaw dropped in unaffected amazement all this while before you and leo hit rainbow sure said jeff and you working for forty a month and stealing your own beef then saving up and buying your little old brand along with bb and leo and old west jogging along working like a yaller dog with fleas well why not wasn't i having a heap of fun where can i see any better time than i had here or find better friends money's no good by itself i haven't drawn a dollar from arizona since i left it was fun to make the mine go round at first but when it got so it'd work i looked for something else more amusing i should think you'd want to travel anyhow travel echoed jeff travel why you damn fool i'm here now will you stay here if you marry her jeff so you've no objection to make if i've got a few dollars that squares everything all right does it not a yeep of protest from you now see here you everlasting fool i'm just the same man i was fifteen minutes ago when you thought i didn't have any money if i'm fit for her now i was then if i wasn't good enough then i'm not good enough now but i wasn't thinking of her i was thinking of um, how it would look 
look who cares how it looks just a silly prejudice they say um, what say they um, let them say johnny maybe i was just stringing you if i was lying about the money how about it then changed your mind again you wasn't lying was you shan't tell you it doesn't really make any difference anyhow end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen at the rainbow's end helen's lips are drifting dust ilion is consumed with rust all the galleons of greece drink the ocean's dreamless peace lost was solomon's purple show restless centuries ago stately empires wax and wane babylon barbary and spain only one thing undefaced lasts though all the worlds lie waste and the heavens are overturned dear how long ago we learned frederick lawrence knowles starlit and moonlit leagues the slow fresh dawn in the cool of the morning bransford came to the crest of the ground swell known as frenchman's ridge and saw low-lying arcadia dim against the north a toy town huddling close to the shelter of rainbow range he splashed through the shallow waters of alamo failing to a trickle before it sank in the desert sands and so came at last to the moat of arcadia with what joyous and eager choking heart-beat you may well guess not the needlessness of those swift pulses or of that joy for eleanor was not there with mrs hoffman she had gone to visit the sutherlands at rainbow's end and jeff could not go on arcadia rose to greet him in impromptu roman holiday poor bransford has never known clearly what chanced on that awful day there is a jumbled whirling memory of endless kaleidoscopic troops of joyful arcadians billy white monte jimmy clark the grim smiling sheriff the judge it was dimly borne upon him by one or both of the two last that there were yet certain formalities to be observed in the matter of his escape from custody of the law and of the horse he had borrowed from the courthouse square indeed it seemed to jeff in a hazy afterthought that perhaps the sheriff had arrested him again if so it had slipped jeff's mind swallowed up in a gruesome horror of congratulations handshakings backslappings badinage and questions heaped on a hero heartsick dazed and dumb pleading weariness he tore himself away at last almost by violence and flung himself down in a darkened bedroom of the arcadian atalanta one thing was clear headlight was there aforesaid smith madison but his nearest friends pringle b b and ballinger though they had hasted back to arcadia to fight jeff's battles were ostentatiously absent from his hollow and hateful triumph johnny denis had pointedly refused to share his night ride from helms and jeff knew why sadly enough the gods take pay for the goods they give and now that goodly fellowship was broken the thought clung fast it haunted his tossing and troubled slumbers where eleanor came through a sunset glow swift-footed to meet him where his friends rode slow and silent into the glimmering dusk smaller and smaller black against the sky the sutherland place made an outer corner of rainbow's end bowered about by a double row of close and interlaced cottonwoods on two sides by vigorous orchards on the other two the house had once been a one-storied adobe heroically proportioned thick-walled cool against summer warm in what went by the name of winter the old-time princely hospitality was unchanged but sutherland had bought lots in arcadia of early days and now the old grey walls of the house were smooth with creamy stucco rod of gypsum from the white sands the windows were widened and there was a superimposed story overhanging wide and low the gables were double-windowed shingled and stained nut-brown 
the gentle sloping roof shingled dormered and soft green the overflow projecting to broad verandas on either side very like an umbrella a bungalow with two birthdays eighteen sixty six eighteen ninety six miss eleanor hoffman had deserted veranda rocking chair and hammock with a sewing basket beside her she sat on a pine bench under a cottonwood of eighteen sixty seven ostensibly basting together a kimono tinted like a dripping sea-shell and faced with peach blossom the work went slowly her seat was at the desert corner of the homestead which was itself the desert outpost of a desert town and her blood stirred to these splendid horizons the mysterious desert scoffed and questioned drew her with promise of strange joys and strange griefs the iron-hard mountains beckoned and challenged from afar wove her their spells of wavering lights and shadows the misty warp and woof of them shifting to swift fantastic hues of trembling rose and blue and violet half veiling half revealing steeps unguessed and dreamed of sheltered valleys and all the myriad voice of moaning waste and world rimming hill cried come faint fitful undertones of drowsy chords far pealing of elfin bells that was pulsing of busy acyclias tinkling of mimic waterfalls the clean breath of the desert crooned by bearing a grateful fragrance of apple blossoms near it rippled the deepest green of alfalfa to undulating sheen of purple and flashing gold the broad fields were dwarfed to play garden prettiness by the vastness of overwhelming desert to right to left before whose nearer blotches of black and gray and brown faded far off to a nameless shimmer its silent leagues dwindling to immeasurable blur merging indistinguishable in the burning sunset east by up over guarding the oasis the colossal bulk of rainbow walled out the world with grim tiered cliffs cleft only by the deep gashed gates of rainbow pass where the swift river broke through to the rich fields of rainbow's end bringing fulfilment of the fabled pot of gold or unused to shrink and fail and die in the thirsty sand below the whilom channel wandered forlorn rainbow no longer but lost river to a disconsolate delta waterless save as infrequent floods found turbulent way to the sink where wild horse and antelope revisited their old haunts for the tender green luxury of these brief belated springs incidentally miss hoffman's outpost commanded a good view of arcadia road winding white through the black tar-brush had she looked she might have seen a slow horseman tiny on the bare plain below the tar-brush larger as he climbed the gentle slope along that white winding road but she bent industrious to her work smiling to herself half singing half humming a foolish and lilty little tune a tisket a tasket a green and yellow basket i wrote a letter to my love and on the road i lost it i crissed it i crossed it i locked it in a casket i missed it i lost it and here miss hoffman did an unaccountable thing wise penelope unravelled by night the work she wove by day like her in this miss eleanor hoffman now placidly snipped and ripped the basting threads unravelled them patiently and set to work afresh now there's no such thing as a ginkgo tree there never was though there ought to be and tis also true though most absurd there's no such thing as a wallaby bird miss hoffman was all in white with a white middy blouse trimmed in scarlet a scarlet ribbon in her dark hair a fine linked gold chain showing at her neck a very pretty picture she made cool and fresh against the deep shade and the green but of course she did not know it she held the shaping kimono at arm's length admiring the delicate colour and fell to work again oh the jolly miller he lives by himself as the wheel rolls round he gathers in his pelf a hand in the hopper and another in the bag as the wheel rolls round he calls out grab 
so intent and preoccupied was she that she did not hear the approaching horse good evening oh miss hoffman jumped dropping the little suffering kimono a horseman with bared head had reined up in the shaded road alongside how silly of me not to hear you coming if you're looking for mr sutherland he's not here mr david sutherland that is but mr henry sutherland is here or was a while ago maybe half an hour since he was trying to get up a set of tennis perhaps they're playing over there on the other side of the house and yet if they were there we'd hear em laughing don't you think mr bransford for it was mr bransford and he was all dressed in clothes waited with extreme patience for the conclusion of these feverish and hurried remarks but i'm not looking for sutherland i'm looking for you oh said eleanor again then after a long and deliberate survey the light of recognition dawned slowly in her eyes oh i do know you don't i to be sure i do you're mr uh, the gentleman i met on rainbow mountain near mayhill mr um, ah yes uh, bransford why so i am said jeff leaning on the saddle horn one half of mr bransford wondered if he had not been making a fool of himself and taking a great deal for granted the other half though considerably alarmed was not at all deceived miss eleanor did not actually put her finger in the corner of her mouth she merely looked as if she had oh won't you um, get down she said helplessly what a beautiful horse why yes thank you i, I believe i will he left the beautiful horse to stand with dangling reins and came over to the bench silent and rather grim won't you sit down said eleanor politely fine day isn't it it's a wonderful day a marvellous day a stupendous day said this exasperated young man no i guess it's not worth while to sit down i just wanted to find out where you lived i asked you once before you know and you didn't tell me oh didn't i oh do sit down you look so grumpy tired i mean rather grudgingly she swept the sewing basket from the bench to the grass jeff's eyes followed the action he saw if you call it seeing the snipped threads on the grass the yet unpicked bastings white against the peach pink facing but he was a mere man hard circumstanced and these eloquent tidings were wasted upon his clumsy intellect as had been the surprising good fortune of finding miss eleanor exactly where she was nerving himself with memory of the quaker lady at the masquerade if indeed that had ever really happened jeff took the offered seat the young lady matched two edges together smoothed them eyed the result critically and plied a nimble needle then she turned clear and guileless eyes on her glooming seatmate you look older somehow than i thought you were now that i remember she observed biting the thread you've been away haven't you i thought you were going away yourself so wild and fierce said jeff evading been away indeed eleanor threaded her needle mamma was talking of going for a while she said tranquilly but i'm rather glad we didn't we're having a splendid time here and mr white's going to take us to the white sands next week he'll be down to-morrow at least i think so he's fine he took us to mescalero early in the spring and the young people here at rainbow's end are simply delightful you must meet them listen there they are now i hear them they are playing tennis come on up and i'll introduce you i can finish this thing any time she tossed the poor kimono into the basket no said this unhappy young man rising i believe i'll go on back good-bye miss uh miss hoffman i wish you much happiness why uh, surely you're not going now there are some nice girls here they have heard so much of you but they say they've never met you don't you want jeff groaned fumbling blindly at the bridle no i wish i'd never seen a girl why that's not very polite is it are you are you mad at me said eleanor in a meek little voice mad oh no said jeff bitterly i'm just coming to my senses i've been dreaming now i've woke up 
angry i mean of course i just say it that way are you mad at me sometimes to be to be nice mr branford you needn't bother good-bye but i'll see you again never when you're not so cross jeff reached for his stirrup oh well if you're going to be huffy never it is then by all means no wait i must give you back your present i have never given you a present some other man doubtless you should keep a list said jeff with bitter and cutting scorn the girl turned half away from him and hid her face with trembling hands her shoulders shook with emotion look the other way sir turn your head you shall have your present back and then if you are so anxious to go go miss hoffman i never gave you a present in my life jeff protested you did sobbed eleanor she turned upon him stamping her foot you said when you gave it to me that you hoped it would bring me good luck and you forgotten you'd better keep a list turn your head away i tell you she sank down on the bench confused mazed bewildered jeff obeyed her she sprang to her feet she was laughing blushing glowing in her hand was the little gold chain now you may look hold out your hand sir jeff's mind was whirling he held out his hand she laid a little gold locket in his palm it was warm that little locket i have never seen this locket before in my life gasped jeff open it he opened it the little eopus glared up at him eleanor charlie gibson toby jeff jamie the little eopus stared unweaking from the grass end of chapter eighteen end of bransford of rainbow range by eugene manlove rhodes